I got a funny one for you. Okay, here, look at this. What we were seeing in the polling data going into this election about what people cared about and the order in which they ranked it. So we have had a lot of questions throughout this time about new voters, people that hadn't been in there before that were perhaps not getting captured by the polling. So maybe this is a sign that we're going to see a little bit more of that tonight. Than Watch we this. We obviously don't know yet. And you know what's missing from this one, two, three, four, five, top five issues? Democracy. <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me, dude? Oh my god, you are such a pathetic piece of shit. Shame on you. Shame on you, you fucking liar. You fucking filth. You fucking absolute dog shit. You fucking piece of shit. You fucking garbage motherfucker. What a fucking liar. What a fucking easily little liar. What a fucking easily little. Holy shit. What a fucking easily little liar. Piece of shit, you fucking garbage motherfucker. I cannot believe it. You fucking piece of garbage. You know these motherfuckers are such liars, dude. I fucking, oh, I despise these people so much. God, why are you such a fucking horrible monster, dude? Shame on you and shame on your fucking parents for literally bringing to this world such pathetic, filthy spawn. You disgusting, vile piece of garbage. What a fucking liar. What a fucking easily little liar. What a fucking easily little. Holy shit. What a fucking easily little liar. Holy fucking shit, dude. Fuck you. Disgusting. What a pathetic worm, dude. Shit, dude. I, I just, ah, uh, fuck you, dude. Fuck you. Disgusting. You disgust me, dude. Hashtag my dick, dude. Lying for clout ass motherfucker, dude. What a fucking liar. What a fucking Weasley little liar, dude. What a fucking Weasley little. Holy shit. What a fucking Weasley little liar, dude. Holy fucking shit, dude. Fuck you. What a fucking liar, dude. What a fucking Weasley little liar, dude. What a fucking Weasley little liar, dude. Holy shit, dude. Holy fucking shit, dude. Literally lying. Still lying to his audience. Okay, that might be COS. What the fuck? Wait, okay. Is it? All right, it's, it's 
you ask for this, sir? I said, what's your favorite anime voice? They say, rap, rap, rap. You say, blah, blah, blah. Talk is cheap, homie. Talk is cheap, homie. Blah, 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 blah. Can't be no one else but yourself. You the best at being yourself. Remember that and never doubt it. Stand up, hello world, shout it. Yourself and the one and only, even when you stand alone, you're never alone. Take the path, let's travel. When they you reach your true level, allow yourself to take the place. She says that she loves me, she just wants to fuck me Got me feeling something, got me feeling nothing Alcoholic junkie, says she thinks I'm funny Think I might get lucky, spending too much money She says she wants my necklace, put her on the guest list Hope I don't regret this, hope I don't regret this I'm feeling hella reckless, cashing all my checks Rich, tickies on my neck, shit, she's on the offensive I do not know my set list, still I'm gonna get Get lit. Yeah, I have a death wish. Live until I'm breathless. I'ma stay progressive. She gon' stay obsessive. Life is so expensive. Do everything excessive. I think my brain's defective. Yeah. Can't think when she's aggressive. Yeah. She snuck into my section. Yeah. You think I'd learn my lesson? Yeah. And we ain't getting no sleep. These girls don't even know me Like Drake, I'm getting trophies You want it, girl, then show me Yeah 
And we ain't getting no sleep These girls don't even know me Like Drake, I'm getting trophies You want it, girl, then show me Cause we ain't getting no sleep Yeah No, we ain't getting no sleep Yeah She's sitting up in the front of the class, using that ass. She gonna pass, keeping her pad and her pen in her lap. She been so bad with the men in her past. Now she just want the professor so bad. I'll give her lessons that she never had, like taking a freshman and teaching her math. I'll keep her guessing until she a grad. She always leaves them guessing. They don't know what's next, man. Learned it from the best, man. She loving every lesson with hands on sessions, points for attendance. She asks a lot of questions. I answer with my presence. I sit back while I'm texting. Said she wants to get it and said she'll bring her best friend know what happened next and you know what happened next man treat her like a guest man rolling out the best man she had a confession yeah she want to stay for a minute she want to play for a minute she want to stay for a minute and now i'm all up in it i'll be back in a minute i'll be back in a minute make a track in a minute and now i'm all up in it no sleep These girls don't even know me Like Drake, I'm getting trophies You want it, girl, then show me Yeah And we ain't getting no sleep These girls don't even know me Like Drake, I'm getting trophies You want it, girl, then show me Cause we ain't getting no sleep Yeah No, we ain't getting no sleep Yeah No sleep It was beautiful, yeah, together Even though we planned forever Days of dreams, nights of talks It was only us together The world was ours, nothing out of reach Imagine where we could be Trying to make my mama prior, that's for sure 
Landed in the city, but my heart is on the coast. I don't wanna look back what my life was like before. I just took a red eye, penthouse, top flow. In the stew, I got a spaz out. Back up in my bag, get the rackets and I cash out. I've been running laps, I don't got time to relax now. I just took a chance, wasn't looking for no handouts. Oh, are they like proud of how we do this? I've been with my brothers in the hills, we going stupid. I can't stop, I've been different, always notice. Trying to turn them boardings into Benji's, needing blue strips. Text me. Wanna show Shotty my heart, she wanna text me. Yeah. All this love I felt was a curse, I wanna ask you. Don't going crazy, all of my nerves, who does it check me? All this time, baby, why you gotta leave me on? Had to drop a bag on her home when she gone. But I'm running with my kid, get it, got me till I fall. Come playing if a bag's worth more than your love. Yeah, yeah. Feel my moment, yeah, yeah. I'm the chosen, yeah, yeah. I'm no one inside. In the stew, I got a spy. Pack up in my bag, get the rackets and I cash out I've been running laps, I don't got time to relax now I just took a chance, wasn't looking for no handouts Oh, are they like proud of how we do this? I've been with my brothers in the hills, we going stupid I can't stop, I've been different, always notice Trying to turn them boardings into Benji's, needing blue strips Oh, oh Honey got me wasted, you done cut the yola, I can taste it uh -huh. Biting on my swag, you niggas pussy trying to trace it yeah. I don't need your love, I took a perk and I replaced it I'ma keep on going till my mama said I made it Black and yellow white, I got thought these different races yeah. Did my dirt, I had a mask, I'm moving faceless, faceless. I got 12 plotting on me, but no cases Running from my demons, lacing on my aces Uh, I don't do that face shit, nah The way they treat me, they act like I'm feeling them So I got a script, I was just trying to feel something Now I'm alone, you don't care, and in I'm the feeling stew, I got a spazzo, pack up in my bag Get the rack case and I cash out I've been running laps, I don't got time to relax now Oh, are they like proud of how we do this? I've been with my brothers in the hills, we going stupid I can't stop, I've been different, always notice Trying to turn them boardings into Benji's, needing blue strips Oh, oh Hi Hello. Do not oh, come. I'm very zoomed in. Do not come. Okay, Hello. <laughs> oh my god, you're so close. What happened? Hmm. Uh, well. Huh. Uh, I, sh I should have checked my camera more before starting. I'm a, I'm a Kuma. Professional streamer, by the way. Let me just try something. Dude, what? I like, I can't zoom out. I'm like really confused right now. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a I really don't know what's going on. Uh, yeah. It was literally fine. I, I checked it before I went live and it was fine. Yeah. I swear. I don't know. I guess that's better. Is this fucked up? It's okay. I guess. Uh, hi, hello. What's up, internet? Um, 
how's everyone? I hope everyone's well. I'm pretty well, except I... I'm just tired. I'm very late, obviously. You can tell that. Uh, but... I'm just gonna keep on keeping on, you know? Just gonna do what you gotta do. Uh, I've been putting off the dark history so long that there is another dark history. So, we have two. It's a, it's a two for one. Special. Just for you. And then we're gonna get into leftovers. Maybe you should do leftovers first. Wait. It is two hours long. Shit. Wait. <laughs> Can't quite. Uh, wait, I didn't really think about that, did I? Maybe we'll save leftovers. I should probably take that out of my title, though. Oops. The fuck? Thank you, Twitch, for always leaving me unmuted when I'm literally trying to moderate my own stream. I think you know that. Fucking Twitch. I swear to God, dude. I swear to God. Late stream. Yeah, I was editing late and, uh... It took a lot longer than I expected, but I still wanted to stream. I was just debating whether I actually want to get into Leftovers, because I just realized that it's way too fucking long. Um, but hi, how are you? Yeah, I spent all day editing and now nothing's getting views because it's all about, like, Cop City. Well, like, three of them were about Cop City. Eight through half, yeah. There's so much going on. And they haven't had an episode for a few weeks. Mm. Different tags, yeah. Um, I never know, like, how to get around it. Like... I can tag it, like, really generic shit that's, like, not really related, I guess. Um, I mean, I got, like, some. Like, there's 30 on the TikTok, but, like... I don't know. I guess TikTok usually takes longer, too. Both TikTok and, and Instagram. And then, yeah, the YouTube got, like, 100. I don't know. But I have, uh, I have a whole bunch more cat footage I need to edit before catter day. Um, so I'll probably just be doing that tomorrow. So much cat footage. There's a really cute one from when uh, Gray was a kitten and he was trying to jump up on the, like, fireplace. Yeah, he's so cute. <laughs> Everyone loves the cat, the cat reels. How can you hate it? Honestly. <laughs> that one where they're like play fighting, uh, seems really popular. The cat's world at the end, a <laughs> dude. <laughs> That one was crazy, um, 
because I think it's like one of my only ones where I had like almost 100% likes. I guess three people still disliked it, but yeah. I'm kind of proud of that. I might remix it. <laughs> With the... Did you see the Instagram one, I think? It's only on Instagram right now where Gray's like tapping the camera. It has like really a really cool like pop, pop type sound. So I think I might like mix that in there. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's really short. Let me make sure. Bup. Yeah, it's just on Instagram. Mm. Mm. Freaking kitties. Endless content, I swear to God. They're so cute. Anyway, <clears throat> let's get into it. Hi. Half the noties from people I follow. I know that shit's so annoying. And like, it doesn't matter what you do, like how much you interact or like, there's no way to like tell it like, hey, always show me this. Like, you just have to do it manually. It's so annoying. Hey friends, how are you today? I hope you're having a wonderful day so far. My name is Bailey Sarian, and I'd like to welcome you to my podcast, Dark History. Now, if you're new here, wow, this is my chance. Me, me. It's my chance to tell no, you the me. story like it is. And just to share the history of stuff we would never think about. All you have to do is sit back, relax, and just let me ramble because I've got some juicy history gossip that I need to tell you. <laughs> because a lot of stuff you just don't learn in school, it's so interesting. So let me tell you how I got to today's story. It all started with one night of insomnia. Yes, yes, I got hit with it again, as one does from time to time. And those of you who have trouble sleeping know you always get the insomnia on the, the nights that you actually really need sleep. So I decided that instead of doom scrolling through my phone apps, I would turn on the TV to one of those cheesy music channels because, um, you know, they always just help me fall asleep. So this one that I was watching, it had some hilarious documentaries about singers with like a countdown. So I turn on my TV Classic. and I'm thinking I'd sure be asleep in about 20 minutes or less, you know? And then the opposite happened, but actually this time it was wasn't that mad because I ended up learning a lot about one of history's most interesting decades, the 70s, and was reminded of how much I love, I love 70s fashion. The bell bottoms. Oh, I have so many bell bottoms. Ew, the pastel so makeup, the big, mm -hmm. gigantic, flowy hair. It was everything. And I learned <laughs> that a big reason all of this 70s. I love 70s fashion. It's so good. Oh my God. I saw um, Austin Show was talking about bringing back. Um, Name your price. Is that it? The fuck is it called? Um, bigger, badder than ever. Austin motherfucking show. Where is this? Pride and joy. Yes, this is the one I wanted to show you. Oh my god, this look. Oh my god, queen. Uh, Absolute fucking queen. She's so gorgeous. Ugh. Iconic. With the feather boa, it's perfect. It's literally perfect. <laughs> They're so cute. Such a good show. It's fashion pop. Dude. Ooh. Everything Austin does is so, like, different and, like really like interesting i love how he's like fusing like original tv content with with like twitch it's brilliant love everything he's doing except the raj show i don't know about that that was maybe uh <clears throat> not a great choice off and came to be was because of a little thing called disco wouldn't that be cool if I had like a disco ball just drop in and we're like, Wah, Wah. you know? Now, if you don't know, disco is a type pass. of experimental kind of up 
up-tempo dance music. It was a different time, <laughs> yeah. That took over the 70s. The first song <laughs> I think of is Staying Alive, which fun fact, was that even disco? Because they didn't even want to be disco. But I feel like disco is kind of a joke to us now, or maybe just an emoji. Like so many people dressed up during Halloween as hippies or disco queens and roller skates, but disco was so much more than fun dance music and hot outfits. I mean, it's thanks to disco queens from the disco era that free spirits like you and I get to express ourselves pretty much however we want. And not only that, disco changed the face of music forever, especially for women. There was no going. Bailey's makeup is always so good. Like, yes, I know she's like a makeup guru, but like, ugh, I love this gold glitter on like a smoky, smoky eye. So back good. and some people were really pissed about it. Before disco, it was men who dominated the music scene with their rock and roll, sex and drugs. I roll. The face of popular music at the time was essentially a bunch of white dudes with long, sweaty rock hair, singing about women and sex. Yeah. Uh, but drag is evil and bad, right? Never mind that all these boomers trying to ban drag is like the same demographic who would listen to this shit. They probably still listen to this shit. <laughs> Not putting together, you know, two and two. And shorts and drugs like Led Zeppelin or Ozzy Osbourne. But in the 70s, music was changing. And that was just too much for some people to handle. And this all came to a head in 1979 during one of the most surprising riots in history, a night dedicated to destroying disco music and disco culture. I'm talking about Disco Demolition Night, which if you're like me, you're probably thinking of demolition what? derbies. Cause I was like, oh my God, they probably had like a disco ball and they would run into each other with cars. <laughs> Nothing like that at all. This is about what? music, baby. In order to get into Disco Demolition Night, we need to talk about what the hell was going on in the 70s. Because it wasn't just all flower power and fashion. There was also a- Sex, drugs, and rock and roll? Major recession. Yeah. Oh, so people were just financially that. screwed. There was the yeah. Watergate scandal where the president straight up betrayed his country. So people just really lost faith in the government. There was the whole uh, Vietnam thing. Yeah. That whole, oh yeah. Oh yeah. All that. Apparently they're not teaching Vietnam in schools anymore. I just saw a headline in the majority report about that. Uh, I don't know. The fuck. And there were so many social movements going on. It was safe to say that there was definitely tension in the air. Just a little bit. Kind of how it feels like now. Yeah, sometimes. And Kinda something like called free love, AKA living with a sexual partner without being married to them was becoming a more accepted thing in society for straight oh, people. No. But this quote unquote free love Devious. did not include the gay community. So if you listen to our Pride episode from season one, you should know that when the Stonewall riots happened in 1969, it essentially changed the way queer communities were able to create safe spaces for themselves. After Stonewall, people of color, gay people, and people who just wanted to be open and express themselves came together and created underground clubs. Now, this was the cool place to be, especially if you're a oh, young yeah. person who maybe was considered as an outcast by the community. But maybe you also want to express yourself and just loosen up a little bit, have some fun, let your hair down, you know? So many incredible parts of culture we celebrate today, like drag balls, sexually empowered music, culture. DJs, glitter on tits. This all came because <laughs> of underground clubs that were started. Yeah, glitter, glitter on, tits on tits started there. Within disco culture, the people created- Oh uh, yes, glitter on tits. The tradition is old as time. Certain attitude, a vibe, the music they wanted to listen to, the fashion, ah, they were creating their own rules and having fun. You know, as soon as you walked into the club in your big ass fur coat and latex top, oh, and don't forget your ankle breaking heels, you were gonna get down to some groovy music, baby. And who were they all getting down to? Well, the undisputed queen of disco. Me? No. How dare I even claim that? I'm talking about, about Donna disco. Summer. Donna would take the stage in these underground clubs wearing these gorgeous feathery outfits, and she was there to sing about love, power, strength, 
and having massive orgasms. Uh, Hell yeah. She has the 17-minute song called Love to Love You Baby. And in it, she sings about loving to have sex with her boyfriend, Hot. During the second half Very of the song, hot. you can hear her having orgasms, about 22 of them. Ah, lucky her. Damn. Which, when you think about it, this is wild. Not really. I think it's kind of fun. I mean, who is having orgasm in a musical performance during this time? So this was a little wild because who was? And to you and me, this just sounds like another song on the radio. I mean, we live in an era about wet ass pussies. But back then. Yes, we live in a society. It's so true. This was shocking. I mean, this was a big F you to the man who was trying to keep those feminists in their place. Women shouldn't be singing about orgasms. Damn feminists. I didn't even know women had. Oh my God, I got a, a comment. I think it was, was it on YouTube or Facebook? No, it was Facebook. Um, And someone told me to go take a shower because I quote, look like I smell like ass and clove cigarettes. Whatever the fuck that means. orgasms huh i mean not all disco songs were like this okay but something about donna just really took hold of the disco scene she just represented something new fun and free to so many people and after all the bs that was happening in society people were ready for a change of course the idea of change can also freak a lot of people out kind of another theme we've learned here on dark history even murder mystery change freaks people out. All this feminism, sexual equality, orgasms, and radical acceptance was downright scary to some people. Now, up until the mid 70s, disco was still known as an- It's still scary to some people, apparently. Just like letting people live their lives. Just, uh, just chill, maybe. Hey, maybe it's none of your goddamn business. Underground DJ thing for young, cool people. I mean, most of the disco scene happened in the dark of the night. It was more like a, a if you know, you know type of thing. It wasn't until a British journalist named Nick Cohn. Oh my God. Disco, was that the original hipster? Wait, were hippies or disco first? I think disco was first, right? Disco was like 60s, I think it started published an article about one of these underground clubs that disco took on a new identity in America. Yeah. Look, hi. In the 1970s, Nick was a journalist for New York Magazine, and he was a really popular rock music writer. So people were very excited when this article or his article came out in 1976. It was called, quote, Tribal Rights of the New Saturday Night, end quote. He started out the article in my personal favorite way by saying, quote, everything described in this article is factual and was either witnessed by me or told to me directly by the people involved. Let's Only go. the names of the main characters have been changed, end quote. I mean, when you think about it, it's like when you watch a movie and it says based on a true story and you're like, hell yeah, this is gonna be fucking amazing. A lot of people were thinking that too. I am never comfy in this chair. This is a side note, but if you've been watching Dark History over on YouTube, then you should know I've been going through very different stages where I don't know what to wear. I started off with like cute clothes and then I went to band t-shirts and then I went to robes and then I went to pajamas. I think I'll just show up naked. Let me know down below if I should be naked. Okay, going back to disco. So this article, it was all about the juicy secret details of the disco scene in Brooklyn, New York. So he ends up following a popular disco dancer. His name was Vincent, allegedly. Now this is how Nick described this guy, Vincent. Quote, black hair and black eyes, olive skin, a slightly crooked mouth and teeth so white, so dazzling that they always seemed fake. Third generation Brooklyn Italian, five foot nine in platform shoes, end quote. Vincent and his friends wore wild, colorful clothing, did the whole lean against a wall while smoking a cigarette move. 
I mean, he, according to this article, he was an Italian stallion by the sound of it for cool. sure. Once a week, Vincent would go to one of these underground disco clubs and absolutely rip apart the dance floor with his like, ooh, ooh, disco moves. And people from all over New York would go to just to watch him dance. Now it was said when he took the dance floor, people cleared the floor to give him space. Like, oh, Vincent's here. He's about to blow it. I mean, not blow it, but like pop off. Yeah. Men wanted to be him. Women wanted to be him. Everybody wanted to be him. And then others would just wanted to be with him. You know what I'm saying? He said there were lists of clothes you needed to have in order to really be in the disco scene. Like Gucci style loafers, floral shirts, rings, flamboyant ass fits, okay? But here's the twist according to Nick's article. You really had to know how to handle yourself in a gunfight because allegedly these disco types were always getting into fights. Which then had me thinking like, okay, Uh let's just say this is true. How did Vincent dance? so well with a full-on gun in his pocket. You know, okay, fine, sure. So when this article dropped in New York Magazine, people got an insight into the disco era and they were like, um, excuse me, I thought disco was just pants and shoes. They had no idea disco was bringing in gunfights and terror into these wholesome Christian neighborhoods. (gasps) The horror. It doesn't matter if most people in the disco movement weren't anything like Vincent. The only thing that mattered to these people was the fear and shock that they felt when they read this article. And actually, one of the most famous movies of all time was completely based on Nick's article. Maybe you've heard of it. It was called Saturday Night Fever, yes that movie. Have you seen it? You know, I never got around to watching it. it really sorry about that. But I hear it's a pretty dark movie. I just, John Travolta creeps me out. Like I like him in Greece, but in Saturday Night Fever, the outfit, he gave me like raper vibes. Now he's in Scientology. So I mean like, yeah. Worth watching? Hmm? Let me know down below. At this time, everybody thought disco was about John Travolta and those outfits, the fighting and the crime and dancing. It just cheapened what disco was really about, a safe haven for creativity and self-expression. But you know what really cheapened the whole thing? Years after the movie came out, Nick admitted that he completely fabricated the whole article every single part of it. The disco scene he created in his article, Vincent, the outfits, the gunfights, they never happened. Never, not once. I don't even know if there was a Vincent. Nobody knows. It was all a lie. Nick, the writer guy, he never even stepped foot into a disco club. He has no idea what was going on. He created a character based off of the random people he saw on the street. And then he would later go on to tell like the news company, quote, my story was a fraud. Great, the end. Just kidding. But it's kind of psychotic of him to do that. But I guess that's what happens when when you give people creative freedom when it comes to their writing for news articles. I'm not sure. But hey, I give him credit for telling the truth, eventually. Most don't. After this article dropped, disco was the talk of the town. But when people talked about disco, they weren't just talking about the music anymore. Thanks to Nick's article and all the social movements surrounding disco, people started having some really heated opinions about it. Opinions that had nothing to do with the actual music. Which honestly sounds pretty innocent, right? I mean, why was it making so many people mad? Look, sometimes people are just scared of new things and that's exactly what was going on. Nick's article really just added fuel to the disco phobia fire. Look, new things are scary, but I'm coming in hot. Yeah, I feel you. I'm very tired too, but gotta keep on keeping on. And as more time went on, people started talking about disco like it was a freaking threat to their kids, to the neighborhoods, to their America. For the haters, disco was directly connected to social issues like affirmative action and racial equality. There was this group of people in Detroit who they were DJs and they didn't like disco. So they came up with their own um, group called the Disco Ducks Clan. Like, Thank you, thank you. Have a good night, sleep well. Could be, could be. Get some stragglers, never know. Maybe I'll stay up very late. Get a a Quantourage raid, potentially. (laughs) No. 
uh, I'm so tired. <laughs> I probably won't be making it long, honestly. <laughs> International Morning Crew, true. Help them wake up with some dark history. You know, a very normal, regular person way to wake up. <laughs> KKK, but Disco Ducks Clan? They were just giving themselves a name. They didn't like disco. And they are like, blah, 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 blah. they even planned to cause chaos at local disco clubs by ambushing their stages wearing white sheets and robes. Jeez. Jesus, take the wheel, please. Thankfully, they never got around to actually doing that. Another group called Dread, it stood for Detroit Rocker Engaged in the Abolition of Disco. Now that's a fucking name. They would perform on air electrocutions, yeah, of disco lovers. So if someone come in, they're like, I love disco. They would do an, um, they would electrocute them, but like it was fake because it was a radio show. Just go with it. Basically what would happen is Dread would ask their listeners to send in anonymous tips about anyone they, they saw listening to disco music. So let's say you you heard your neighbor jamming out to Staying Alive. You would call into the, the radio station and say, um, yes, I'd like to report a crime. My neighbor is actually listening to disco music and here's his phone number. And then the radio station or Dread, they would call up this guy because you gave him their phone number and then call them up, call them out. So then everyone who's listening would know that this person was into disco stuff. So yeah, no matter who you were, you had an opinion on disco. Disco at this point became mainstream and the clubs were popping up everywhere in the big cities. You couldn't even like walk down the street without seeing someone dressed up in like Saturday Night Fever inspired disco outfit. And most of all, you couldn't even turn on the radio without hearing a disco song, whether you liked it or not. And this was back in a time when radio was all you had, unless you went out and bought records, but that could be really expensive at the time. It wasn't long until the music was everywhere and it was almost like there was no other music and other music just didn't exist at all. You know what it kind of reminds me of? It reminds me of a famous animated movie called Frozen. I roll. Because when that movie came out, you could not get away from it. It was everywhere. Everywhere I turned, someone was singing, Do you wanna build a snowman? This shit drove me crazy. I never even saw the goddamn mo fucking movie. I, I, I didn't see it. I still don't want to see it. Why was it everywhere? Why was everyone singing it everywhere? Don't subject me to that shit. I don't have kids. I don't have to listen to that shit. Don't make me listen to that. It's the same with fucking Baby Shark. Why? Leave me alone. Man, and I'm like, no. No, I don't want to build a fucking snowman. I got things to do, bitch. First of all, there's even <laughs> snow here, but that doesn't matter. So disco was like that times a hundred. And this didn't sit well with some people, especially one man, a man who made it his mission to try and get rid of disco on the radio and bring back rock and roll. He was like a Karen before Karen. His name was Steve. <laughs> his name was Steve Dahl and he hated disco music. He was like the old man who tells you to get off his lawn. <laughs> type of guy. Yeah, that was oh, no. Steve. Steve had wanted a career in radio ever since he was a teenager. He used to hang out in the radio stations in his hometown in California, and Steve was gonna be a radio DJ, no matter what anyone told him. Dream big, dream big. The music that was big when he was growing up was rock and roll, baby. So he naturally thought, hey, when I'm a DJ, I'm gonna play all the rock and roll all the time. But by the time he got a job in radio, rock just wasn't the vibe anymore. Disco had taken over and Steve hated it, but it wasn't just the music. Steve said that one of the reasons he hated disco so much was because he didn't look good in those disco suits. It was a movement he just couldn't fit into. And you know, when you're younger, you just wanna fit in. And when you can't, it's easier to hate it than to be sad about it. But the reasons didn't matter to Steve. I'm tired. What a mood. At the radio station he worked on Same. called WDAI, he would always talk about how much he hated disco. And then one day, right around the holidays, Steve's boss broke the news. Disco was so popular that they were going to change the radio station he worked out from rock to Chicago's first disco station. I mean, this is gonna bring in the numbers, baby. This is where it's at. But Steve could not bring himself to be a disco radio DJ and the station knew that. So they fired his ass. 
Yep, they fired him, Joan. Yeah. And you know what happens when you piss off a white man? It does not go well, especially when you fire a white man. It does not go well. Now, losing your job, it sucks. It's not easy. But for Steve, it was just like, I don't know, a salt in the wound. I mean, get it, like, listen, he was young. He just got married. His wife had just quit her job. They sold their house. There was pressure from his in-laws. Uh, well, they're asking, hey, what are you gonna do with your life? Huh? Are you still gonna work in radio, Steve? And he's like, oh, I don't fucking know, shut up. You know, it's just not a good time for him. And he's like sitting around, stewing in his regret and shame and upset, thinking about how disco ruined everything for him. He'd given everything up for this job. And then Disco took it all away from him. It was said his wife got him a dartboard with the radio station he w used to work for, had the logo on it, and he would just throw darts at it all day. Oh you God. and I probably think that's very juvenile, but it is. look, it's better than him actually it throwing is. darts at the real people. Let him have it, okay? But eventually, sure. Steve's harsh winter of fun employment came to an end. So, at the age of 24, Steve fun somehow employment. lands a new job at another radio station. And this radio station played classic rock. Now, this one was a rival to the one he had just got fired from. So, Steve wanted to stick it to his old bosses because why the fuck not? And he decided to make a scene while doing so. I like revenge. It's kind of fun sometimes. If it's towards the right person, but the white man always confuses who the right person is. Don't probably still do play classic rock too. Yup, you betcha. They, yeah. As soon as he started this new gig, Steve did all sorts of things to shake up the airwaves. One major thing that he put together was an anti-disco army made up of his listeners called quote the Insane Coho Lips, aka the Cohos. I know what you're thinking, because I was thinking the same name. What the hell is this name? It's not catchy. The Cohos? The Insane Coho Lips? I feel like I'm missing something. <laughs> Chicago 97.9. We haven't changed our playlist since 1971. Deadass. Deadass, dude. <laughs> it really is like that. I don't know, dude. I don't know. Earlier in the episode, let's see, where are we right now? We're at 2409. 2409. Um, she was talking about disco and, like, also hair bands. Where was this? No. No. Dude, where was this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hello? Wait, oh, it's kind of a joke. Hippies were disco queens and roller skates, but disco mm -hmm. was so much more than fun dance music and hot outfits. Hair I mean, bands, it's yeah. thanks to disco queens from the disco era that free spirits like you and I get to express ourselves pretty much how disco was in yes. and shorts and long, sweaty... This. I'm like... So the the people who are trying to ban drag in America right now listen to this music still by people who are basically in drag. You do ponytails with them? I'm sorry, what? Uh, I mean, yeah, they were called hair bands because they all had like big hair. Like this. <laughs> Not like hair ties. Led Zeppelin or Ozzy Osbourne. But in the 70s, music was changing. And that was just t too much for some people to handle. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's just so much hypocrisy. It's annoying as fuck. The insane coho lips. I feel like I'm missing True. something. Well, I guess it was a play on a name of a street gang called the quote the insane unknowns and a local fish called the coho salmon. This is so white. 
isn't it's a it? Lot. Anyway, the Cohos, the Salmons, bonded over one simple idea. Disco sucks, period. End of story. Backspace, backspace, quotations, period. Period, exclamation point. <laughs> Quotation commas, backspace. Wow. Period. Enter, enter, enter. <laughs> Tab. That's right. And Steve commanded this army of cohos to be all sorts of disruptive. Co now, think of them as like the... Cohos? Why does it sound like a slur? K-pop stands. Just think of any stand that goes way too hard for anything. Yeah, that's how his stands were. They went hard for Steve. Mm. They did whatever Steve asked. Dude, what the fuck? What the fuck am I looking at on my... What the fuck? On my For You, what the hell is this? What in the god damn hell? This makes me want to cry. You can't just put pineapple on a burger. You can't do that. What are you doing? Tasty, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? You cannot. You cannot. I draw the line at pineapple at pizza. Even that is a vestige of colonialism, which... You know what? I might take it back. You know, just because you physically can does not mean that you should. This should be a goddamn war crime. And honestly, as the American in the room, I think I have, uh, you know, jurisdiction here. If you want something caramelized, have onions, like a normal person. Unacceptable of them. Now, one time Steve was on the radio and he was getting all his co-hosts hyped up. He's like, yeah, hey guys, we're going to meet at this teen disco club out in Chicago. And then the listeners, the co-hosts are like, yeah, yeah, what? And then what, daddy? What? What? He's like, yeah, we're going to F Look, up those. I love pineapple. Pineapple by itself, very good. Very tasty. Eat that, please. By all means. But do not... Do not make this artisan burger bullshit. If you're gonna have a burger, you should have a good old-fashioned American burger. There's nothing wrong with it. You can put some mushrooms. You can put garlic. You can do all kinds of shit. That's normal. You don't gotta do all that. Disco people, and they're all like, yeah! Raging hormones and st More caramelized items. Oh my god. Jesus Christ. Look. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Okay? Stuff. So they all go there. And Look, tomato is already a fruit. How much more sugar do you need on your burger? And fill up the teen disco club and just stand there, taking up space, making sure no one can dance to disco music. They literally shut down the dance floor because they all hog it. So no one can dance if you're just standing there, which is the opposite of salmon. Salmon kind of like goes... <laughs> Oh my god, I get it! Salmons, because they go against the flow of the river. Okay, it's making sense, Steve. Tomato is antithetical to the concept of burgers? You gotta get the fuck out of here. You're kidding me, right? You think uh, a fucking pineapple is more normal? Not as a sauce? Ketchup. Bitch, ketchup. Tomato ruins burgers? No. You just need to have a good tomato. I don't eat, like, old, like, fast food tomatoes. Th those are gross, and they've probably been sitting out for a very long time. But, like, a nice heirloom garden tomato? Delicious. Because for a minute there, I was... <sighs> I get it. But I'm the bear. <coughs> You're welcome. At this point, Steve realizes he has serious power with his stands. 
Uh, so he gets them to do something else. On air, he tells them, hey, you guys, if you're listening out there and you see that van from my old radio station, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna throw some marshmallows at it. And guess what? That's exactly what they did. And we may be thinking, what's the point of throwing marshmallows at it? The point is, Steve is realizing he got some power with his listeners. So the next thing Steve did at this new radio gig was take out his frustration by literally destroying disco records on the air. Literally. Did I nail the it? Fuck? Literally. Whatever. Like he would announce what Announce album him. he was holding Perfect. in his hands, say who the artist was, slide the record out of the cover. It's very ASMR before ASMR was a thing. He would then put it on a turntable, but instead of playing the music, he would drag the needle across the record, just completely ruining it. Then he would blow it up, quotes, because he would like actually use um, sounds of explosions, you know, an explosion sound effect. And, and to make it seem like he blew up the record. And fans <laughs> love this shit. One fan of Steve said, quote, my friends and I hated disco. You felt you Hilarious. weren't pretty enough or skinny enough to fit into it. I remember Steve saying the reason he hated disco was because he couldn't buy a three piece white suit off the rack. And that stuck with me because I couldn't either, end quote. I know, like, why don't you guys just like band together and do something you all love, like a craft True. party or something and make your own pants? Why do you gotta ruin other True. people's fun, you know? That's my fuck? whole question here. <sighs> I mean, no one hires me for president, but they really should because I've got ideas. Some bacon on that pineapple burger. Just try it. Uh, I would try it. I would try it. I'm not saying I wouldn't try it. I just don't think I would like it. It doesn't sound very good to me. I'm not a big fan of like fruit where it shouldn't be. I'm into like fruit in pastry, but like that's the most I can do. Like, I'm not sure yet, circle back. So Steve was but tapping into something, yourself. but he didn't oh quite God. know how big that something was. His hatred of disco was really resonating with people. And one person in particular was listening and got an idea that would change the course of disco music forever. And this all took place on a fateful night in Chicago, Illinois. Now I don't really talk about sports on this show because sports are just not, you know, they're not that. I'm not into it yet, maybe when I get older. But today I'm gonna mention baseball. Specifically, the Chicago White Sox. In 1979, I'm told the White Sox sucked, which, first of all, I could co completely understand because White Sox are really hard to keep clean. Your White Sox turn brown, and no matter what kind of bleach you use or anything, they don't go back to being white. I don't get it. Why do you even buy White Sox? Anyways, but I also hear that the baseball team sucked. Their record wasn't that great. Their fans were pissed off and people weren't buying tickets to their games. So the owner of the team resorted to coming up with interesting promotions so people would buy tickets to the games again. You know that giant scoreboard you see in every baseball stadium? Well, the White Sox had an exploding scoreboard that shot fireworks out of it. That's what- Look at this. Look at this delicious cupcake. Wonderful. I'm so excited. Toxic, toxic but intense passion. Oh my god. I don't, I don't know that. I don't think that's true. Yeah, <laughs> Ultra burger. Oh my god. Jesus Christ. Why don't you just say Uber burger? An Uber burger for an Uber mensch. What the fuck? That's what they say. So every time you went to a game, you got like a little fireworks show. And the team's owner also installed a janky outdoor shower near the stadium seats so he could soak your hot body and clothes during those brutal Chicago summers. Which a lot of people were like, mm, that's different, that's weird. And I was like, ah, I would do it. I would give it a try, that sounds nice. When it's hot or humid, ugh. Be able to take a little rinse off, I'm down. Maybe just me, okay. And surprisingly, the fireworks no one asked for and the unique outdoor shower still didn't raise ticket sales. The stadium was- <laughs> Burger Uber Alice. What the fuck? <laughs> Stop. And even filled a quarter of the way through and they were hemorrhaging money fast. This is when Steve somehow gets involved. 
So there's this other guy, his name's Mike Veek. Now this guy was a son of the White Sox owner, so he's probably rich. And get this, he was a big fan of Steve's radio show. Maybe he was a co-host, Stan, we don't know. But uh, Mike was trying to find a way to get people back to the White Sox games. He gets in his car, drives to the radio station, waits for Steve to finish his show. Now Steve does his usual attention grabby thing, like uh, smashing records and, and bashing disco. And the minute he's done, Mike bangs on the door to the studio. Steve opens it up and Mike says he has an idea. You know those records you've been destroying on the radio? Well, what if you did that at the White Sox Stadium? Like on the field, huh? Now Steve didn't even blink an eye. An anti-disco night in front of thousands of people? Ooh, I see it now. Me, Steve, the center of attention? Hating on disco? Ugh, sign me up. So Mike and Steve set the date, July 12th, 1979. And in the days leading up to it, Steve is on the radio promoting the hell out of what they're calling Disco Demolition Night. He kept telling listeners that, hey, if you wanna bring a disco record to the baseball park, you can get a discounted ticket to the stadium for just 98 cents. Oh, less than a dollar. And on top of that, the White Sox were playing a double header, AKA two games in one day. Cause I didn't know what that meant. Just in case anyone out there is like, what's that? Two games in one day, back to back. And this is important to know because it was between these two games that Steve was going to blow up the piles of records in front of the whole stadium, like a little halftime show. Because of Steve's following and his ability to, let's say, motivate people to do things, the White Sox owners expected 35,000 people to come out for the event, which was a few thousand more than for normal game days. But when Disco Demolition Night finally rolled around, it turns out they were way off. It was estimated that 60,000 people showed up that night and there were thousands hanging around outside the stadium. Yeah, so almost oh, 60,000 oh, Steve stands. That's a lot of people, huh? Yeah. So these are co-hosts, these salmons oh, are everywhere, all holding oh, records in their hands. And what do you think is gonna happen when that many hardcore disco hating fans mm -hmm. show up? You one dollar beer night? Oh God. You really think they're gonna follow the rules here? They're here to celebrate hate. What do you think they're gonna do? They're just gonna sit there and smile while Steve blows up records? Hmm. Yeah, that's what they really thought yes. was gonna happen. So cute. First they're of all- They're just gonna sit there and smile politely, surely. Well, when people got to the stadium, there wasn't one big box for all the disco sight. records people brought. There were dozens of boxes of records packed to the brim, just ready for Steve to blow up. It's so like, geez Louise. So yeah, the promotion worked, good for him. But disco hating fans were not waiting for Steve to start some drama. One of the guys selling soda at the stadium said that fans brought extra records to throw like a Frisbee onto the field, but they were gonna do this during the game, which made me laugh, kind of giggle at first, but that actually, um, when you think about it, that can like seriously hurt someone because when you toss a record, like a Frisbee, if you give it a night enough, that could like, chop someone's head off a frisbee from freaking hell which great horror film idea if you're out there frisbee from hell i'd watch it you know and little did we know that was kind of a foreshadow into the night now the atmosphere was reportedly feeling quote a little mayhemish end quote just a little First-hand witnesses said that dozens of banners were hung around the stadium with anti-disco slogans like, Disco sucks! Or another sign that said, Burn, baby, burn! Disco Jesus, is why do they hate it so much? What the fuck? Fuck shit. You're so boring. Honestly, not that creative. Come on. Seriously. What do you expect Get from alive. Salmon, huh? Then, as the first game was coming to an end, people started chanting, Disco sucks! An intact record wouldn't do much harm. But vinyl shatters into very sharp shards. Yeah. I mean, it could... If it hit you right, it could definitely hurt you on impact, but... Disco sucks. So loud that it drowned out all the sounds on the field. 
Not that anybody was there for the actual game, but still. So the first baseball game came to an end at about 8.16 p.m. and the blowing up of the disco records was about to begin. The crowd was getting super amped up. People were chanting. They're pounding on their chairs, shouting, ready for action. And they're just so excited to hate disco. Everybody in the stadium knows something big was about to go down. They just weren't sure what. And then when the clock strikes 8.40 p.m., a door in center field opens up and a Jeep Commando drives onto the field. Commando. <laughs> and riding inside the Jeep Commando was uh, Steve Dahl. And I guess he had been drinking a little, so he's a little sloshed. He was wearing military clothes and a general's helmet, which obviously to the audience looks like he's gonna fight. So that's really setting the tone here. So Steve shows up, he enters the field, he's looking around, thousands are cheering for him. Oh man, he's probably taking all this in, feeling like he's a master of the universe, it's feeding his ego, but you know, it didn't take long for him to get a taste of what he created. As the Jeep was doing a slow driving tour around the park, the fans that Steve recruited to come to this event were throwing full beers and cherry bombs at the Jeep. If you don't know what a cherry bomb is, I guess it's like very powerful. It's illegal. It's an illegal firework and it could actually kill a person, but it has such a cute name, I know but very beautiful if you practice safe cherry bombing. Good to know. While this was happening, Steve was a little confused, like, wait, hello, why are they throwing fireworks at me? I am their God. Now he thought these people were on his side. So he's feeling a little nervous, like, hmm, it's not nice, but he shakes it off and keeps going on with his performance. After the Jeep does a loop around the inside of the stadium, it comes to a stop in the middle of center field. It was time to explode a box of records. <laughs> so much drama. Now their goal wasn't to make the whole box explode because they didn't want like some huge dangerous boom. They just wanted to make sure that the records would perform and like fly out of it. At this point, Steve and another guy are now standing out in the open in center field. Steve was getting the crowd super pumped up. He's yelling into a microphone and just yelling stuff at them like, yeah, disco, boo, words. He had no prepared speech or anything. He just, yeah. <laughs> You know, he wasn't giving a performance. Ugh. At least give us a little dance or something, my God. So apparently during all this, there were three nuns in the audience that night. I'm not sure if they were there for the baseball or for the disco part of things, but they, these nuns, were starting to get worried with all the insanity going on around them. And they turned to a woman that was sitting nearby and asked, what are the people chanting? And the woman said like, don't worry, they're just, saying, let's go White Sox, praise God, which wasn't true. But what else are you gonna tell a group of scared nuns? The truth, they might have a heart attack. Come on, be nice. You make me feel like dancing. I wanna dance the night away. You make me feel like dancing. So cute. While Steve is out there whipping the audience into a frenzy and soaking in every second of attention he's getting, thousands more people, most of them part of Steve's little army of co-hosts, were outside the stadium looking for any way to break in, feeling deep FOMO they wanted in on the action. But many of them didn't have 98 cents. Ugh, what a rip. Times were tough, but they wanted to blow stuff up. Come on, let us in. So what do you do? What do you think they did? You got that right. I felt like Reba right now. That's right, what'd she say? You got that, that's right. They ended up bum rushing the stadium. Snaps. Oh, you guys didn't see that coming? Even Joan saw that shit she's blind. Why are you laughing? She's blind. She can't see? Oh my God. Don't let her laugh at your disability, Joan. Mike. The White Sox owner's son from earlier, well, bling, 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 he's like, hello. He got a call from the security. They were right outside the stadium saying, look, Mike, listen, there's a bunch of kids, thousands of them, and they're trying to break in. What do we do? Yeah, so there's thousands of kids, they're outside. They're rocking the ticket booths back and forth and scaring the shit out of these defenseless employees who are just there to collect 98 cents and then go home. And not just that, some people started climbing fences, scaling walls, 
jumping over gates and crawling through open windows to get inside the stadium. The situation was getting a little out of control. So Mike has to think quick. I mean, the safety of these employees is on the line. He didn't really care about the safety of the, of the employees. He cared about the stadium. And he's like, oh fuck, they're gonna tear up the stadium. This is kind of backfiring, Mike. What are you gonna do? Well, he makes a phone call that he regrets to this very day. Is he still alive? Hey, Mike. Inside the stadium, there were a bunch of security guards in yellow jackets standing all around the baseball field. They were there to make sure the audience kept their butts in their seats. They're trained in crowd control, but Mike offers 15 of them to leave their posts on the field and head to the outside of the stadium to save those employees and the booths and whatnot, and also stop the thousands of people from storming the gates. Now, do you think 15 people versus thousands of people is gonna work out? I'm sure you can imagine it's not gonna go that well. So back no. inside the stadium. No, I don't think it's gonna work out great at all, Bailey. No, I don't. Yeah. Steve sees his opportunity. He announces to the audience, quote, disco sucks and we're never gonna let them forget it. They're not gonna shove it down our throats. We rock and rollers will resist and we will triumph. And he probably pulled his dick out because I feel like a lot of guys do that when it's not needed, but they do it, you know? Or is that just me? So yeah, whipping this out. Uh. Steve then lights the end of the dynamite with his gout, I'm sure. Seconds later, kablam! The explosives go off like a bomb, destroying the disco records. Now, shards of razor sharp records go flying in the air. Record wrappers are burning on fire in the outfield. The explosion leaves a hole in the middle of the baseball field. Oh, but how are they gonna play baseball? No one knows. It's Damn. chaos, art imitating life, life imitating art. It was disco and they didn't even know it. Oh, okay, yeah, back to the story. Security, remember security? Well, they're nowhere to be found because they're out in the front trying Curious. to handle those people. So once that bomb goes off, woo, the audience members, they look Shit. at each other and they're like, yeah, it's time to rage. Zeppelin forever, brother. It was the green light, baby. The audience starts rushing down the stairs, Rock jumping over seats. Those poor nuns lost in the crowd, running onto the field by the hundreds. It was out of control. At this point, everyone knew um, mm, I don't know, you guys. I don't think this is some dumb radio st stunt anymore. It turned into a full scale riot. Those poor nuns. I hope they made it out alive. One vendor at the stadium said he remembered everything like it was yesterday. Some kid with long hair jumped out of the stands and onto the field. He then sprinted to one of the bases, ripped it out of the ground and waved it around like it was a trophy. The vendor said everyone else followed the long haired guy's cue and started ripping stuff up too. Yeah, humans are pretty dumb. Us humans are really stupid. So I believe this story. I do. So, um, okay, stoned and drunk teenagers climbed out of the stands and slid down like these big poles that went onto the field. They went down them like they're freaking uh, firemen responding to a call. It's kind of beauty and grace. But instead of putting the fires out, these people were looking to start them because just above them, a sportscaster reported that people in the upper deck were pouring lighter fluid down the big poles <laughs> trying to light them on fire, but they're metal. No. Everyone was raging a little too hard to notice that these poles were made of metal, so they actually couldn't catch on fire, but they tried, okay? Now this was just kind of supposed to be like a little halftime show, a little halftime celebration where we just hate disco, but then we go back to baseball. And all those players that were getting ready to play the second game were just hiding, dodging shoes. They were dodging trash, things on fire, whatever else people were throwing at them. They put on their helmets and they looked for cover. One player named Rusty even said, oh my God almighty, I've never seen anything so dangerous in my life. In the dugout,
dugout, the rest of the team was taking shelter, just trying to stay out of harm's way. And it was pretty clear at this point, security was uh. not gonna be any help because where the hell were they? The players had a death grip on those baseball bats just ready to defend themselves against potential rioters. And one player asked them if they're going to use those bats against them. Look, if the rioters or whoever came down into the dugout, they were ready to defend themselves if needed. Then like, I guess there was a time when like the player went onto the field to look at like the damage that was being done. And the second he did this, something whizzed by his head. I guess someone threw a disco record straight at him and it was thrown so hard that it stuck right into the ground next to him. And the player was like, holy shit, man. Like I could have been killed by the village people. Could you imagine cause of death decapitated by the village people record? I'd put that on my headstone. And speaking of those records, Vince Lawrence, who was an usher working that night, happened to know something a little suspicious that was going on. Lawrence, who was a black teenager, Sussie. had a brilliant idea. You see, he was an aspiring musician and he saw this event as an opportunity to not hate on disco, but this was an opportunity to grab a hold of some of those free records people were just throwing away. Jackpot, I mean, why not? He could True. build a solid record collection. True. And I love that for him. Honestly, resourceful. Save the records. So he's out there and he's starting to gather up all these loose records. Decapitated by the village people. Oh my God. He's finding, expecting <laughs> to see, you know, disco records like the village people, the Bee Gees and ABBA. She's like, yeah. But Lawrence starts to notice something else. A lot of the records he was scooping up or were the ones that were blown up, weren't even disco. And in fact, tons of them were actually R&B records by black artists like Curtis Mayfield and Otis the Clay. Fuck. Then at one point, Lauren the said fuck. some guy ran up to him, snapped his disco record in his face like it was his fault disco even existed. After that, it was clear to Lawrence that this wasn't just a fun night for people to let off some steam. He said, quote, it was a book burning. It was a racist, homophobic book burning. Where's Lai Lawrence? It does seem that way, huh? But stuff like that was happening all around the stadium. I mean, it was total madness. Maniacs were tearing urinals off the walls of the bathroom and smashing them, which is so gross because people pee in those. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Come on, find something else. All the bases were torn apart. People were throwing more fireworks and cherry bombs. There was a picnic area with seats in the left field. Fans broke into that ripped out the seats, threw them in a pile in the center, and then lit themselves a bonfire. Nearby people were dancing in circles around the burning vinyl records like it was some weird satanic cult ritual. Bizarre. The head groundskeeper and his son said that it had gotten so scary that they locked themselves in the office and just waited for things to die down. That was their uh, safe bet, really. That's all you can do. And remember that Jeep from earlier? Well, they blew that shit up. Just kidding, but wouldn't that be fun for the story? That Jeep blew the fuck up and there's an explosion and they all die. I'm just kidding. I have been doing a lot of murder reading lately. Anyway, and that Jeep from earlier, the one that Steve rolled in on, yeah, that's... Yeah, white men would never do that. That's definitely not something that they regularly have done and will continue to do forever. Definitely not that. Still all was on the field, which is weird because you think someone would steal that Jeep. I would go right for the Jeep. Not only were fans throwing stuff at it, but now they were approaching it. The driver freaked out because he sees people approaching e him. He floors it, hits what? the gas pedal, gets the hell out of there, comes out the way they came in but he forgot that there was a photographer who was sitting on the hood of the car. And I guess when he flew, Hashtag not all men, but actually seriously all men. <laughs> Ordered the photographer flew off. And I guess this photographer managed to stop his fall by hanging onto the windshield wiper for dear life. The driver did not give a, a rat's ass, okay? He sped off. Hashtag not all men, but somehow always a man. Off and tried the, to get the hell out of there. Not long after that, at 9.08 p.m., only 28 minutes after Steve first stepped foot on the field, gates in the outfield roll wide open and in rides the Chicago police on horseback, rolling in two by two. 
I mean, someone must have called them to say what's up, or maybe they saw it for themselves. But either way, they were ready for the crowd, and they were all decked out in riot gear and armed with clubs. When people saw that, they were like, oh shit, you know, party's over. Because people knew that the Chicago police were not afraid of using their clubs. As soon as the police started closing in on the rioters, they parted like the Red Sea and they just booked it out of there. It shut them up real quick. The crowd finally started dying down and eventually order was restored. Steve said after it was all over, he sobered up and stayed at the stadium for a while. Steve, he then got a little lecturing by the owner of the, the White Sox and then went home for the night. Mm, yeah. When I read that, I was like, oh, that's it? He went home? The guy who incited a riot? Shouldn't he be arrested? You think he'd be held accountable for something? I mean, he brought thousands of people to the stadium, right? And after all was said and done, thousands of people ended up storming the field and causing thousands of dollars in damage. And some reports said that there was up to 30 people who had very serious injuries. But Steve, just no, Steve, no, go home, okay. And that's all he got. While the White Sox owner was in the office, he was just beyond stress, complaining that his leg was killing him. And then in front of everyone, he unscrewed his prosthetic leg, plopped it on his desk. Then he pulled out a cigarette, took a deep drag, and used his leg as an ashtray. And honestly, I had to keep this into the story because this right here is my kind of man. Yes, baby, you take off that leg and use it as an ashtray. Yes. I mean, it's a rough night. Who could blame the guy? <laughs> Moment in a Honestly, it's just clever, you know? Use whatever, uh, whatever is on hand. American history, I say. Now, there are a lot of accounts about what happened after Disco Demolition Night. Many people say it was just a fun night where thousands of people got to trash disco music and yeah, sure, things got a little out of hand, but it was no big deal. And Steve actually thought Disco Demolition Night was very successful. One thing we know for sure is the violence of that night really freaked out record labels because they didn't want to be the one on the receiving end of that hate. One famous DJ said, because of this one night, Quote, it scared the record companies, so they stopped signing disco artists and making disco records, end quote. Like for example, Donna Summer kept recording and making music, but now records were labeled as dance music and not disco. At this point, disco was kind of like a touchy subject that nobody wanted to touch. And it's not like disco completely went away, but it did kind of go back underground into clubs back where it started. Made a whole full circle, didn't it? Exhausting. So what's our takeaway here? Joan, go ahead, share with the room. Oh, you're not blind? Oh, my bad girl, I thought you were. You know, not everything's about you. Okay. Anyways, honestly, it's kind of hard to find just one takeaway here because there are so many damn pieces to this. Some say Disco Demolition Night tapped into a whole lot of resentment about how the face of music was changing. Maybe it was the article that fueled people's perception of disco. Maybe it was the co-host. Yeah, fuck Salmon. But the hate was real. Maybe it was just all of it. The perfect storm, all at the right time, just and it exploded because the Steve guy just is so grumpy, right? I mean, to be fair, Steve didn't create that resentment. He just exploited it, right? And it worked. I mean, radio stations that switched to disco went back to playing rock. Then even the freaking Grammy Awards canceled their best disco recording category after just one year. Wow, it happened so quick, huh? Interesting. Others say Disco Demolition Night was a night dedicated to getting rid of, quote, black music. The real disco scene was made up of many communities of color and people who belong to the LGBTQIA plus community. And many people believe- QU? You? I haven't heard the U included in a long time. Can we please just call it quilt bag? If we're gonna use all those letters, we should call it quilt bag. Yeah. <sighs>
the U.S. River Management Club. I believe that Steve and the co-hos and everyone else who hated disco just used it as a cover for resenting people that didn't look like them. Steve has denied that Disco Demolition Night was ever racist or homophobic. He says it was just about the music. But we know uh-huh. that there were people who probably participated in that riot who felt differently. It wasn't just about the music for them. It was about the whole scene. The world was changing. And as we have learned here in dark history, some people just don't like change and they will do anything to stop it from happening. Honestly, I think our biggest takeaway is no matter what you listen to, it's good. (laughs) Two things can be true at the same time. I think there's a time and place to rage. Have you ever been in a mosh pit? If you haven't, you should go. That's where a lot of people- I recommend it. I recommend it. It's fun. As long as you're in like a safe one. There are some that are uh, a lot more dangerous than others. Let out their anger. Ooh, yeah. I definitely got some hair pulled out in my early 20s in a mosh pit. Stepped on, beat, kicked, spit on. I got my pants pulled down one time. Anyways, mosh pits. Great place to release that anger. But if people start literally blowing things up, rioting, lighting fires, and destroying property because they didn't like Diana Ross, like maybe, I don't know, you're overreacting a bit. I don't know. Yeah. It's just my thought here on this couch. Maybe. This room. Alone. (laughs) With my thoughts and feelings. But we wouldn't have so many of the artists we have today without disco. So for one, I am glad it existed because for me, the makeup, the bell bottoms, the hair, the glam, the fun, the beat. I mean, disco really, it gave us house music, which then gave us EDM. Like, it's an integral part. Wouldn't be here, okay? And Ooh, my favorite part, right as of right now, we're kind of in the middle of a disco revival. So lean in, have a little fun, relax. If somebody likes something that you don't understand, I don't know, maybe just mind your own business and get back to crafting. If you know of any of those underground clubs, let me know where they are and I'll be there in just a few minutes. Invite me, please, I'll show up, I wanna go, that sounds fun. Now I like this story because it seems like it's about one really specific thing, disco. But it's actually really about how one really angry person with power can essentially change history and music as a whole, which happens over and over and over again. I mean, we can really see it today when people are angry about Mm -hmm. something or scared of change and they feel like someone. Yeah, no, it's happening now. Like (laughs) rappers are getting charges for the lyrics in their songs like. It's supposed to be like free expression, but uh, no, they're like catching Rigo charges, racketeering charges for lyrics. And standing up for them, they will go to some crazy lengths to keep the status quo. But look, change is inevitable. It's all about how you handle change. So people listening or watching handle it gracefully. If people are being assholes, maybe don't be an asshole. Mind your own damn business. And from one of my favorite classic movies, one of my favorite lines is, let it go, let it go. I think we can all just let it fucking go, can't we? Let it go. Shut up. I'm sure Disney's don't get it stuck in my head. That. Well, everyone, thank you for learning with me today. Remember, don't be afraid to be curious and ask questions and snoop around because you deserve that. Now, I'd love to hear your guys' reaction to today's story. So make sure to use the hashtag Dark History over on social media so I can follow along. Join me over on my YouTube where you can watch these episodes on Thursday after the podcast airs. And while you're there, don't forget to check out my murder mystery and makeup. I hope you have a great rest of your day. You make good choices. All right. Dark History number two.
Hi friends, how are you doing today? I hope you're having a wonderful day so far. My name is Bailey Sarian, and I'd like to welcome you to my podcast. It's called Dark History, baby. This is where I get the chance to tell the story like it is and to share like the history of stuff that honestly, we will probably never think about. But I think about it at like 3 a.m. for no damn reason. So all you have to do (laughs) is sit back, relax, and let me share with you some hot, juicy history gus. And this is Joan. And uh, what's his name? Paul. Okay, so normally I like to start my episodes by telling you how I got here. Because there's always a way as to how I got to this topic. So... If you don't know, I moved recently and I moved. So there's like a lot of boxes everywhere and there are still boxes that I have yet to unpack. So, you know, on my free time, I kind of go through boxes, do dot do. And let me tell you, there was this one box I did open the other day. And like, I don't know who packed this thing. I mean, it must've been me because it was my box, but it was kind of like, you know how in every kitchen we all have a junk drawer You know, it's like where you throw all that nonsense, but you need it. So think of this box as like the junk box. I'm talking there were everything from Little Caesars coupons to a (laughs) post-it that said, do not remove. No idea what I was not supposed to remove, but oh well. And then randomly (laughs) there was half a pack of fruit stripe gum. I love that gum. But then at the bottom of the box, you know what I found? Well, I came across my old TI-83 calculator. Yeah, you remember those? Talk about a blast from the past. When I picked it up, I almost- Literally triggering traumatic memories. Threw my back out because those things are freaking heavy. It's kind of a great weapon or, you know, if you ever lock your keys in the car, don't worry, just throw that calculator right through the window and problem solved. And then I started reminiscing about the past. What was even the point of that calculator? And what were we calculating? Do you remember? No, I don't either. I don't even know how it works. No idea. And then, flashback memory. Hey, remember the SATs? Yeah, great segue. I know, I know. Look, some of us were told that our test scores would determine the rest of our lives. I mean, even our whole damn future. And if we didn't get a good test score, we wouldn't go to college. And then we would turn into trolls and then be alone forever. (laughs) And then you die. I mean, all of that can be known with mm-hmm. one little test score. It's true. I don't know, but I didn't want to find out. I mean, I know people. I know people, first of all. Do I? No. But I know people who were not good test takers in school. And then they would feel really bad about themselves because of one little number. But I mean, even they would go on to do great things. I mean, hello, hi. My name is Bailey Sarian and I'm a bad test taker. Yes, I had to take my driver's test way too many times to count, if that's any proof. Thank you. So then I had a thought, like, do these random ass tests even matter? And what about like the holy grail of them all, the SAT? Well, I found out over the past couple of years, hundreds of colleges have just stopped requiring standardized testing to determine if you could get in or not. So of course people just stopped taking them. And it got me wondering if they could just take them away or just stop taking them. Like, what did it even measure? And who was it designed for? And have people always taken these tests? I realized it was time to take a deep dive always. into the history yep. of standardized testing. Since the beginning of humanity, we've taken the SAT. I know. Exciting. <laughs> but it is. So settle in. Get out your scantrons and number two pencils and keep your eyes on your own damn paper. Jimmy. This story starts in, drum roll yeah, please. Timmy. Not ancient Greece for once. Yeah, I know. Today's story actually takes us back to Imperial China, specifically during the end of the Qing Dynasty. It's Q-I-N-G. So this was back in the 1800s. Now here's a very quick explanation of the Qing Dynasty. Very complicated, um, but I'm gonna give you a little rundown. Now, this was one of several eras in Chinese history that lasted from the 1600s all the way through the 1900s. I mean, longer than America has even been a country. And there was an emperor who was kind of like their president who oversaw a government that consisted of hundreds of people. So standardized testing in the 1800s, yes, they did it back in the 1800s, was nothing like we know it today. For starters, it had nothing to do with getting into college like it does for so many of us. In Imperial China, 
I'll be back in a second. Standardized testing was the only chance you could get at actually changing your life. And for millions of people, the only chance you had to actually get out of poverty. Many people in China were not born rich, most coming from working class families who lived in small villages of about 100 people or so. Most families struggle to get food on the table, so they were always looking for opportunities or ways to make their lives better, but the jobs just were not there. You were either basically a farmer living a tough life or a merchant on the road selling goods, which also was not an easy life either. The only way to have a better life was to basically get the golden ticket. I've got the golden ticket. I've got the <laughs> ticket, John. That's right. Okay. Anyways, the golden ticket. And the only way to get the golden ticket was to pass the standardized test set by the Qing dynasty. Dun, dun, dun. So why would the Qing dynasty even care to test the public? That got me thinking. What do you think? Wrong answer. Well, they did it for a bigger purpose. The Qing Dynasty was looking for new blood. They wanted to find the best and smartest people for their government. They would give the everyday person an opportunity to take the test, and then they could look at everyone's test scores and figure out who were the smarty pants out there. Now, most governments would look to their relatives to pass on the power to, you know, people in power tend to pass it on to like their sons their cousins, their brothers. But the Qing dynasty had a different thought. They were like, hey, hey, what if we brought in people that were, I don't know, smart, knew their numbers or something. Now they, they're not necessarily big and buff like in other countries, but their brains were filled with knowledge. Huh? And you know what they say, knowledge is power. Mm, it was kind of smart when you think about it, right? So true. Mistakes were high. If you passed, you might go from everyday worker to the second highest ranking official in the whole country. The only person who would Shit. be above you is the emperor. So this is a big opportunity, right? These exams, they would Massive. take place every three years. You'd be given three separate tests that would take 24 to 72 hours to finish. Probably where Scientology Damn. got their inspo from. We'll save that story for another day. Oh shit, what? But you would be tested on calligraphy skills, essay writing, math, knowledge of government matters, poetry, and speaking. But in addition to that, test takers had to memorize whole ass books by a famous philosopher and politician, Confucius. Now these tests were said to be totally mentally and physically draining. This guy, his name is Benjamin Elman. He's a professor of Chinese studies at Princeton, who's done a lot of research on late imperial China, estimated that only one in 6,000 test takers would succeed. That's Damn. like getting struck by ice. I was gonna say ice cream, but that's what? obviously incorrect, <laughs> Bailey. Hence why I never did well in school. Most people would give up after failing, but some people were determined to be that one, especially one man named Hong. Like a lot of the other villagers he knew, Hong spent decades of his life preparing for these exams. But Hong was working long hours as a teacher and was barely scraping by. It was said there would be times when the school didn't even have the money to pay for their teachers and said they would pay them with like tea or food. And you're like, thanks. And any of Great. the free time was actually spent studying. Hong's parents didn't have a lot of money either, but they knew that their son was special. They believed in him. And what little they did have, they spent on education for Hong so he could have a better chance at passing these exams. Wealthy families could afford private tutors to have their sons start prepping for the tests at the age of four or five. And sometimes a young man from a poor family would get lucky and would get like a, a wealthy sponsor who would buy them their books um, or tutors. But getting one of these sponsors was not easy. You essentially only had a chance at this if you were born what's called a bastard child, AKA born out of wedlock, and your dad was rich. He would do the quote unquote right thing by setting you up with funds for your books and a tutor and you could ace the test and rise up from the ranks without daddy. For some, it was just better to pay your kids off rather than being an actual daddy. 
but you know, okay. Unfortunately for Hong, not much has changed, huh? He was born with both parents, so boo. So he just had to like study. <laughs> yeah, boo, he had to take the long way. He would study his ass off and just work with the resources he did have. And even though Hong prepared like crazy, he would go on to take the exams twice and sadly fail twice. He felt the years of studying was just becoming a waste. And it was eating him alive. But he decided, you know what? I've put a lot of my life into this and I'm not gonna do nothing about it. I ain't got shit going on. I'm gonna try again. And guess what? I mean, sometimes they say third time's a charm, right? So he decides he is going to try at it again. On the day of testing in 1837, Hong and a couple hundred other students walk into this huge government building. Picture something like a castle, but not fun. Everyone is carrying a little pack of supplies with them, like candles, food, and ink for their quills, because it's the 1800s, ink for their quills, yeah. And they also brought blankets, because like this wasn't a two hour or five hour test. This test would take up to three whole days. Oh yeah, they would be um, inside of this building. No one would be allowed back in or out. And these tests were not given in an air conditioned room for eight hours. I mean, these tests were extreme to say the least. Fuck, man. So before you entered this castle, you would be searched head to toe by a guard, very intimidating guard, to make sure that you weren't smuggling in any cheat sheets. Cheaters, beware, you're gonna get searched. Once they got the thumbs up, the test takers would walk over to what looked like dozens of rows of private cells. Honestly, it kind of looks like uh, prison cells. The bright side though, each person would get their own, their own cell. So that's cool. Now here's the first question I thought of. Maybe you can relate, maybe not. I'm like, what so about, cool. you know, what about when you gotta go to the bathroom? Well, Luckily, they nicely had given you a nice plush wooden poop bucket. Yes, and it would be right next to your cell. It was outdoors, I guess. Um, but hey, at least you got somewhere to go to the bathroom. Now, if you don't move for three days straight, which some test takers did, no eating, no drinking, no pooping, no sleep, you're just sitting there sweating and stressing, you could die. And no. guess what? People actually did die. And the, the administrators fuck? in charge had a process for handling the body. I mean, would they let the family in to get, retrieve the body? Of course not. Don't be silly. They didn't want to disturb the other test takers. So they rolled the corpse up in the blanket they brought, went Jesus to the building's Christ, wall yeah. and chucked it over the side. It's not funny, but they would chuck that body right over the side so the family could come and pick it up. Curbside pickup started in the 1800s. Wow, who would have thought? Mm -hmm. really so as soon as you finish the test. Dude, when uh, I was in the IB in high school, I don't know if everyone's heard of this. It's the International Baccalaureate. It's very rigorous. It's like, it's like AP plus. Um, there was a horror story that went around that, uh, I don't even know if this is true. I don't even know, but um, I think I have a feeling that it was probably just a uh, a little bit of an old wives' tale. But um, there was a story that a, a kid, when taking his uh, his higher level exams, rather than finish his math exam, decided to like take two pencils on the desk and just uh, shove them directly into his eyes by like, like slamming his head down. Uh, fucking awful. Such a fucking awful horror story. But like, yeah, there should never be like that much pressure on a test where like, there's even like, you know, like a, a tall tale going around about it. That's uh, that's fucked up, man. <laughs> I'm gonna fact check this. Yeah. <gasps> 
Oh yeah, that was the the other half of the story was that everyone in in the test room got a a seven out of seven um, on their tests because they like had to witness that. Oh my god. Hmm. Wow. There's a lot of, like, first-hand stories. Yikes. Maybe it wasn't false. It might have actually happened. Holy shit. There's another story about a student who did, uh, he, uh, overdosed. Um. There's a Wikipedia page called Pass By Catastrophe. Pass by catastrophe is an academic urban legend proposing that if some particular uh, particular catastrophic event occurs, students whose performance could have been affected by the event are automatically awarded passing grades on the grounds that there would be no way to assess them fairly and that they would not be penalized for the catastrophe. Yeah, they probably would just like have you take the test another day. May make allowances or adjustments. Do, do, do. May apply for an adjustment of their score up to 5%. Yeah. So maybe it was like a mix of like fact and truth. Um. Such a brutal story. Snopes. It's a legend. Thank God. Apparently this was originally about a, a college. A college course. Oh. What the fuck? Though we've yet to happen upon an instance of a despondent student ending his life in such a fashion, an article in 2000, uh, in a 2000 neurological mag magazine described the case of a male inpatient in a psychiatric ward who was found to have shoved a 14 centimeter ballpoint pen up through his nasal passages and lodged it in between the two hemispheres of his brain. A full-length pencil was also retrieved from his nose. The pen was removed and the patient was made an uneventful recovery. He just recovered after putting a pen in between the hemispheres of his brain? Holy shit. It's not like all things were fine and dandy. Oh, nay, nay. Hong and the other test takers, they waited anxiously while the tests were graded. You know, praying to God. I hope, I hope. It was done anonymously, so no testee would be getting any type of special treatment. So while Hong waited, he was just crossing his fingers and dreaming like, you know, about this big celebration that's gonna happen if he passed. I mean, even though the test taking was brutal, the celebration if you passed was like you- Hi, Tyre, welcome in. I'm pretty good. Um, I'm a little tired, but you know, keep it on, keep it on. How are you? Euphoric. I picture like it's winning Miss America where you're just like, oh my God, oh my God. You know? 
That's what I imagine. So they'd line up all the winners and dress them up in like red caps and blue clothes. And they'd give them black satin boots, very chic. And then they'd climb into something called a sedan chair. I know, it looks like this box with a chair. And then on the sides, it had draped velvet, very luxe. Let's say you scored super high and you're being celebrated. You would get to sit in one of these nice seats and then people would lift up the seats and like carry you to the other side. I'm hoping you can imagine this at home. It was like you were royal for a few minutes being carried, woo! And these winners would be carried to the- Too many meetings, that sucks. Meetings are the worst. Drop the small human off. Right on. So excited. Oh, that's cute. <laughs> that's adorable. Confucian Temple of Canton, where they'd hold a ceremony. Then the head of the testing program would come out and congratulate them, put gold flowers on their red caps, put a red wreath around their neck, give them a cup of wine to celebrate. Years of studying for one glass of wine, worth it. The winner's families would be notified so they could race over to the temple and escort them home. On the way home, they would play music and dance and sing and there'd be streamers. Uh, yeah, you know, just, it was a whole celebration. The beginning of a new life. So Hung is sitting there with his eyes closed, imagining all of this all his sacrifice and his parents' sacrifice would be for something greater. Well, <laughs> I'm not laughing at him, but like, you know, it was sad because he actually didn't pass. Hong did not pass. He wasn't the one in 6,000 test takers that passed. He failed. I don't know, Hung. I don't know, bummer. This time he didn't go home and cry about it. This time was different. I mean, he ended up snapping. Okay, snapping as far as like, he started having visions where he was seeing and talking to Jesus, Shit. that kind of snapped. Hung was really in his feelings and just really frustrated, not only for himself, but for his fellow test takers. He felt like the exams were setting people up to fail, that they were actually impossible to pass. And they were probably doing this on purpose. It was like the government was dangling a carrot in front of regular people like, you too can be somebody if you just study hard enough. We promise, you know? But Hung believed it was actually for a fake promise. Okay, everyone's lying. No. Nope. He was realizing that the rich, they kept getting richer and the poor kept getting poorer. Could this test be one big gigantic mindfuck, essentially to keep the two social classes divided? I mean, if someone tells you that you're a failure, hmm. you might be? believe that you are in- What's changed though? Literally nothing. Literally nothing. Holy shit, it's crazy to me how little has changed sometimes, like, bro. Indeed a failure. Hmm. And Hong was not the only one who was fed up. So he and a ton of other people who were sick of the government's BS led the way to something called the Taiping Rebellion. Now, we don't have enough time to cover the full story of the Taiping Rebellion in this episode. What you should know about the Taiping Rebellion, and let me know down below in the comment section if you want me to do this episode, because it's actually really fascinating. <sighs> but what you do need to know about it is that it, the Taiping Rebellion lasted for over 10 years and around 20 million people died because of the battles that happened during this time. 20 million. That's like if all of Australia just up and disappeared and Hong, would go on to become a quote unquote prophet. And uh, a lot more happens during this rebellion. But I think in this story, it's pretty wild that a big reason this whole thing started was because people were like, I'm a bad test taker, <laughs> you know? So it seems like those tests were set up to reward the students who had an advantage in life. And to be able to do that, it was a lot easier if your family had money. I mean, in theory, these exams were open to everyone, but they really favored wealthy people with connections. It's literally the same with the SATs. Holy shit. Oh I mean, God. sure, it was hundreds of years ago, but this all sounds a little too familiar, huh? Those imperial exams continued in China, but then they started spreading all across Europe. Standardized tests popped up in Italy, in the form of oral exams. And then it didn't take long for the French to get in on the action and they actually create IQ tests 
as we know them today. So now you're probably wondering, well, how did all these tests make it all the way over to America. In the early 1900s, the army wanted a way to figure out which recruits would be good for leadership roles. So they called up Carl Brigham, who was a famous psychologist at the time. And Carl just learned about IQ tests from some French pals. And he was like, hey, let's do a version of that for the army. That way the idiots can go to the front lines. This is what they're thinking, not me. The idiots can go to the front and the smart people, well, they could just get promoted. Let the dumb ones die. Now, Carl wasn't just a scientist. He was also a big old eugenicist. I know, I know, this got me thinking, wow, it's been a while since we mentioned eugenics. Remember season one of Dark History was pretty much all eugenics. I learned so much. Well, we meet again, but a little memory refresher, if you don't know, eugenics the simple version is essentially weeding out the quote unquote undesirables from the general population. Usually had some ulterior motives. Anyway, Brigham studies the soldier IQ test results for a few years. And after all was said and done, he came back on the scene in 1923 with a splashy new book called quote, A Study of American Intelligence, end quote. Not surprisingly, most of his books said that immigrants and people who were not white were pulling down America's intelligence. Wow. But because of this book and the army testing, Brigham is put on the map as the go-to guy for standardized testing. And one company that went straight to Brigham for test help, you know them, you probably hate them, you can't name one of them, the college board. <laughs> Bring them out, bring them out. Wouldn't that be cool? The college board, come on in here. Like who's on the college board? Exactly. Well, I don't know. Is there even a college board? That's the real question here. Huh? Just a bunch of corporations in a trench suit, I imagine. Expose the college board. Who are they? Bring them out. If you don't know, the college board was the company that tested high school students to determine who should go to college. They're the gatekeepers. So they go to that Brigham guy and they're like, hey, we hear you're like the new test guy. You wanna like create some tests for us? And Brigham was like, hell yeah. You know, he gets to work, he gets paid. Plus he gets like credit from the college board. Come on, come on. In the year 1926, Brigham presented the board with the Scholastic Aptitude Test, AKA the SATs. Those crazy ass army IQ tests are the reason we even have the SATs. Yeah. Now, the SAT nowadays is about 150 questions and there's a time limit of three hours or four if you decide to take the essay as well. In 1926, when the test first came out, they only had about 97 minutes to answer 350 questions, which a lot of people were like, bitch, I'm gonna need more time, please. But also it's not Imperial China with their four day ventures, you know, like damn. Students weren't actually expected to finish the whole test because that would mean averaging 18 seconds per question. The American version didn't take off any points for wrong answers. So you were allowed to guess. And instead of the three different subjects students are tested on today, there were nine different subjects. There was definitions of words, classifications, antonyms, number series, analogies, logic, paragraph reading. What was that? Something called artificial language. Antonyms, number series, analogies, analogies, logic, paragraph reading. Something called artificial language, which to me sounded like, I don't know, communicating with future aliens. Also, basic math was on there. In fact, the questions from the first SAT are all available online, so you could actually take the whole test, which I was like, wow. I am on it. And then I forgot. I was gonna take it so I could tell you guys, but then I had a humbling moment where I was like, what if I score really low and then I just embarrass myself? So Joan, you take it, let me know, girl. Okay, 1926, great, happens, first test. And this is exactly when the very first SAT happens, but only 8,000 seniors in high school take it. 
But then the president of Harvard decides to make the SAT mandatory in order to get scholarships. Harvard had all this money. I mean, they wanted to make sure it went to the most deserving students, not just the rich ones. And having Harvard's blessing really gave the SATs some serious street cred. It became the gold standard. And by the late 1930s, most American colleges were like, oh, you want in? You want in? Well, you're gonna have to get a high score on that SAT test. Which that makes sense, like someone has to gatekeep these colleges. But at the end of the day, it's just another version of the Imperial China situation. They're like, oh, you want in? Take this test that nobody passes. Mm hmm. But then after World War II, the SATs really, they got a, a boost because everyone was wanting to go to college. This is because the government had passed something called the GI Bill, which provided money for soldiers who wanted to get their education. And I mean, they go off with their education, which is like, good for you. So a ton of people are trying to go to college. Half of the college students in America were actually soldiers who were usually the members of the everyday working class. I mean, at this time it was like education for all. And in the 1950s, with more people wanting to go to college, the popularity of the SATs skyrocketed. So then the 1950s comes around and there was the Korean War and the SATs had an interesting role in, in that. If you scored high enough on the test, you could actually get out of the war. And a good SAT score made damn sure the government never called your number when it came to draft time. It was like a uh, Monopoly get out of jail free card. So could you imagine the pressure? You're like, I don't fucking wanna go to war shit in a year. And if you got a low score, you better start packing your bags because you're probably going to war. Even though this was obviously messed up. I mean, that's what the thinking was. They didn't want to send quote unquote brilliant kids to the front lines where they'd be killed. Yeah. Imagine if they accidentally sent like the next Einstein to fight in the front lines and he died in combat. We wouldn't have electricity. Okay. They believed that this would set America back years. And everyone was like, you know what? That's a great point. Great point. The pressure was similar to China, except the difference here is that getting a bad score on the SATs not only prevented you from going to school, it could literally get you killed. It's almost like a fun choose your own adventure game. I sure do miss those books. So money, as you know, money can buy you time. Time to study and learn how to score high on these tests. And the people in America who had the money and opportunity to study tended to be white which was exactly what Brigham, the inventor of the SATs wanted. But even though people were starting to see the bias and flaws in the system, it was still becoming more popular than ever. I mean, come on, if you think about it, in order to get the American dream, you had to get a good SAT score. In the 1960s, the American dream meant getting married, having a good job, a nice home with a white picket fence, 2.5 kids, maybe a dog, I don't know. But the point was to be happy, successful, and have a family. And college was the key to that dream. And by 1960, we went from 10,000 kids taking the SAT to over 800,000 kids taking the SAT. I'm sure your brain is wrapping around that. This is a big jump, isn't it? But at this time, it costed money to take the SAT. It costed like around three to six dollars to take this test. Now let's do math here. I don't do math, but if let's say $3 times 800,000. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know either, John. I was looking at you, but look, millions of dollars in revenue. And we know in America, when damn near a million people do anything, someone is going to figure out a way to profit off of it. And when someone figures that out, you know, there's going to be another person who's going to want to compete with you for that money. So what I'm getting at is by the time the 1970s roll around, there are now two tests, the SAT and then the ACT. Yeah, I know, I, don't even get me started because you see, there was this guy, his name was Everett, Everett Franklin Lind Lindquist. I don't know. He was like, look, I smell money. I smell money over here and I want in. He notices how much the college board is making on selling the SATs to the students and he wants in on it. 
So he invents something totally different. Fucking capitalists. Corpa, I think we can make more money. The ACT, AKA American College Testing. And well, <laughs> what's the difference? Well, the SAT had goofy questions. For example, one question was, quote, a candy company sells premium chocolate at $5 per pound and regular chocolate at $4 per pound. If Bobby buys a seven pound box of chocolates that costs him $31, how many pounds of premium chocolates are in the box? I hated these questions. I mean, I love chocolate, but I don't know. That's why I'm not weighing the box of chocolates. You know, I'm just paying the cost. I don't know. I'm not trying to be aware in life. And that's how I approach these tests, with my smart mouth. Hence why teachers never liked me. And the ACT wanted to test people on everyday knowledge they would actually use. I mean, what a concept this was, right? I'm mentioning this because some of you are probably familiar with the ACT or maybe just the SAT. Either way, they're both essentially the same and both were not really sure what the purpose is. You know, the number of standardized test takers got bigger and bigger. I mean, through the 90s and the 2000s, it just, it got, it grew. Cause more of us are doing it. And more importantly, oh my God, it's so funny. It's like, if your friend would jump off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? And the whole lesson is like, no. But when it comes to test taking, we all jump off the bridge. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Wow. Hilarious. The things we do, huh? It doesn't make sense ever. And more importantly, a huge industry was created around all this test taking. And the SATs were just raking in that money, but not because people were getting help on the test. The opposite actually. It's because of the people like you and I, who didn't do well on them. The repeat customers. And that's not me throwing shade. I just know who did well on that test. I never met them. Have you? Okay, maybe I have, but like, I'm just mad at them, whatever. You see, taking another test, let's say you fail and you have to- I actually did pretty well, even though I'm not like a particularly good test taker. I, do, I just like studied a lot. I'm just kind of a nerd. Do it again, it costs $65. And then if they registered late, well then that would be like another $30. And then let's say you want your test results early so you can apply to college on time. That's also gonna be another $31. So roughly, let's say it's about $120 each time. Oh my God, that was like an SAT little math situation I did. Smart me. And then keep in mind with millions of test takers out there, you and I should start getting into this. Let me know, we could start our own test. Thank you. Now, these numbers aren't gigantic, but for a family on a very tight budget, which is honestly most of America, that's a lot of money. But the college board, they don't give a shit. <laughs> Who are they? Nobody knows. But in 2016, 6.7 million students took a version of the SAT. Now, I don't do math, but I used that calculator I found and I was like, boop, 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 boop. And, um, 6.7 million test takers times $120 equaled a lot of money, like 800 million in one year. Exactly. In one year. Honey, we are in the wrong job, aren't we? Let's get on this test taking stuff. I'll print a Scantron. I don't think they use them anymore, but I'll figure it out. So yes, the college board, whoever they are, they probably meet on a really nice yacht and they are not worried about you failing, okay? Today, the College Board is a billion dollar company. Not only that, they are a billion dollar nonprofit company, which a nonprofit is technically a business that exists for public or social benefit. So they're supposed to do good for the community, <laughs> but the College Board, it's kind of hard to see what they're doing for the community when you hear that they bring in over a billion dollars a year like, where does that go? The math ain't ma mathing up. And they're relying on us to not figure it out, aren't they? You would think if they were really a nonprofit, wouldn't they just, I don't know, idea, make the tests free? Hmm, just a thought, I don't know. I don't know. I'm a bad test taker, I don't know, but like, I don't know. So when it feels like your entire life is on the line when you take this test, you're willing to do pretty much anything to ace it. And there are plenty of people ready to take advantage of that. 
I mean, come on, you've seen those giant SAT prep books, the tutoring classes, the prep classes, the practice tests, they all cost money. And that's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to standardized test prep. And no, you cannot do some horizontal collaborations to get out of this test. I've tried. Anyways, meet Stanley H. Kaplan. Probably sounds familiar. I've seen a commercial for that play. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Stanley was tutoring young test takers in his Brooklyn basement, which weird location. I feel like this belongs on a Monday episode, but okay. Like he's like, come over to my basement and I'll tutor you. Put on this lotion. <laughs> he didn't really do that, but he probably did. His students must have seen results because word spread far and wide about this guy and like what he could do to help you score high on that test. Students from all over America traveled to Stanley's place in New York to uh, put on the lotion <laughs> and learn the best way to pass the SAT. Put on the lotion? In 1938, he founded Kaplan Inc. And by 1975, Stanley had 70 locations around the country where they would tutor and help people study. <laughs> Today, they've got like over 12,000 employees. And Kaplan, they prep students for every standardized test under the sun. I'm talking college exams, law school, med school, any damn test you can think of, Kaplan does it. And business is great because we all want to do well, right? So we can be doctors and lawyers and shit. And we need those people. We need you. From tutors to classes to books to software programs, students, pfft, shell out about a billion dollars a year on test prep services. People spend anywhere from $50 to $3,000 prepping for these tests. And I'll give you one guess who is dropping thousands of dollars on this stuff. And it's not the average American because pff, who can afford that, okay? It's the wealthy Maybe. people. It's Aunt Becky taking the test for you or whatever she did. S guy off, oh no but that's what I heard one time. Not her, but maybe, I don't know, horizontal collaborations. And they would spend so much money <laughs> and they have essentially created their own private education system. Researchers have a specific word for this and they call it shadow education, which shadow education is exactly what it sounds like when Peter Pan comes in and you know how his shadow follows him. It's like that, but nothing like that because it has to do with private education and I just wanted to mention right. Peter Pan because that's what it sounds like. And you know, anytime I cannot talk about school is great. So shadow education is essentially like private education that is happening in the shadows and that only the wealthy can afford. Point blank, uh, period. And honestly, yes. we don't really know that much about it because it's really shady and secretive. We must penetrate the system. <laughs> Who's in? I'm in. You in? It's We're all in. in. We meet at midnight. Shadow. Look, this is also a billion dollar industry that's hiding in plain sight. It's so spooky. It has nothing to do with Peter Pan, but I wish they would call it like the Peter Pan. It doesn't matter really, move on. Because a Texas A&M researcher spoke to a shadow education tutor. This tutor charges like $272 per hour to tutor. I know, again, we're in the wrong business, you guys. I can tutor. With parents dropping thousands to help their kids get into their dream school, so the parents could have bragging rights, let's be honest, they didn't give a shit about their kids' education. You'd think Kaplan and tutors doing all the shadow stuff is the key to get to getting good test scores. But actually, no, it's not. Because research from Duke University showed test prep doesn't actually really have a huge effect on overall test scores. It helps with like 20 to 40 points which is like, uh, is that worth it? But the most interesting no. part of the research to me was something we actually already learned from Imperial China. The research drops the bomb and gives away the number one secret to getting the best SAT score you can possibly get. Are you listening? Coming real close because I'm giving this to you for free. I should be charging you for free? at least 2,600 an hour for my education that I am giving you to for free. So come in real close, get out your notepad. The secret to getting a good SAT score is to be born rich. 
You're welcome. I'm not being sarcastic, actually. This is what the research actually said. <laughs> it's funny because it's sad, okay? It's sad for us. Yeah. Kids who come from families that make at least six figures, quote, tend to score 179 points better than kids who live around the poverty line, end quote. And this is why so many people believe the SATs are rigged. Now this next thing probably won't keep you up at night like it does for me. Sometimes at 3 a.m. I'm wide awake questioning all of my life choices. It's normal, <laughs> right? One of those being like, what was up with those number two pencils? Why did we always have to have a number two? Was the number three not okay? Was there a number three? And can someone please tell me what happened to the number one pencil? And then don't even get me started on those Scantrons. What the hell was a Scantron when you think about it? It was the weirdest thing. Lots of odd things that we just didn't question, huh? And like, who was benefiting off of all of those pencils and Scantrons? Yeah, I think about this at night. I think about this. I want a refund. I tried to see if there was anything shady surrounding those things, but no luck. I guess the pencil is fine. You're in pencil. But I do keep coming across something called the Atlanta Public Schools cheating scandal. I read that something like 44 schools and 178 teachers got into trouble for changing answers for their students so they'd get better scores. Ooh yeah, baby, I love that. Now this is one of the biggest education scandals in US history. It's funny because in research they point this out, but they, they fail to point out all the rich people paying off colleges and stuff as being like the biggest scandal, but I digress. Some of the teachers are actually still in prison right now for this scandal, but uh, no Aunt way, Becky dude. and Felicity Huffman, they're out walking free. Seems fair, huh? Holy shit, dude. Holy shit. What the fuck? They're just trying to help their students. Free these people. It's not that I'm saying we should be against standardized testing, but maybe we shouldn't be treating these tests like it's the matter of life or death. I mean, or maybe they just need a revamping. Why is there always like a train is coming one direction and a train, you know? There's so many examples of why we shouldn't. I mean, during the pandemic in 2020, they just straight up stopped doing the SATs. Yeah, now they're gonna be, I don't know. It's just like, what are we doing? So I guess, what do we do? Give the SATs a makeover? Do we keep it? Do we get rid of it? I personally don't have any answers. Literally get rid of it. It's so much stress for no reason. Answers, so stop trying to copy my work. But one thing I know for sure is what we have now maybe isn't working. Hmm? I should thought. I mean, the SAT, or I should say testing in general, teaches a person to prepare self-discipline, dedicate time and energy to something, and then self-discipline again. There is a bright side to taking tests. They are teaching you basic life skills that could get you somewhere in life and how to be an, a fucking adult because you have to have some self-discipline, right? Great, so we need testing. But uh, to the extreme of SATs, I don't know. That's why I would love to hear from you guys. So if there's anything to take away no. from this. Kids already take a ton of tests. We don't need one more test. I'm giving you permission to not stress. The sun always rises another day. Just because you're a bad test taker doesn't mean you're gonna be a failure in life. You can still go on to do cool things. You could still go on to go to college, be smart. It just takes a little bit more work. I swear I didn't like actually get my brain to work until my mid twenties. And then I was like, oh, I wouldn't mind going to college. So look, we're just humans and it's okay. And listen, most of all, if you don't know what you wanna do with your life, that's okay, period. Life is weird, okay? None of us know why we're here, but we are here for some strange reason. These tests don't determine your whole future, okay? True. So relieve yourself of the stress. Take a break if you want. Go travel somewhere, eat, pray, love, whatever. As long as you are, I don't know, being a good person and trying your best in life. It'll all make sense one day, I hope. Well, everyone, I feel like I'm not leaving you with any positivity. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Let me know down below. Do we need SATs, ACT? I think we need testing in general, but how should it be going? Maybe we should rid the college board or demand that we know who they are, huh? Just an idea. 
Thank you for learning with me today. Remember, don't be afraid to ask questions. Even when you get told to shut up, you still ask away. Hmm? Now, I'd love to hear your reaction to today's story. So make sure to use the hashtag dark history over on social media so I can follow along and stalk and see what you're saying. If you want to come down to my basement and study, just let me know. <laughs> I've got lotion. Join me over on my YouTube where you can actually watch these episodes the on Thursday after, what is with the lotion? after the podcast airs. And while you're there, you can also catch my murder mystery and makeup. <laughs> I hope you have a great rest of your day. You make good choices and I'll be talking to you next week. Goodbye. Dark kiss. <laughs> okay. Um speaking about uh how America sucks. Great segue. I what know. I can't help but communicate that I find frustrating is that there are actual crises happening in this country. A couple weeks ago, there was a devastating, devastating derailment in, in East Palestine, Ohio. And yesterday, I was just lucky enough to wrap up a hearing early. And I was going back to my office. It was not scheduled. It, it wrapped up early. And there were people from East Palestine at my door because they weren't getting a response in in their own other levels of government. And so they were just roaming around waiting for anybody to open their door to them to talk to them, any member of Congress to talk to them. And so we sat down and they explained what's going on. And this committee needs to hold a hearing on what is on the derailment in East Palestine. This is not just a disaster site. It is a potential crime scene People are poisoned and their respiratory issues are getting worse day after day. And I, I really I'm, I, I really make this plea on a bipartisan basis. Truly, I truly do. The chemicals that were spilled in East Palestine have short half lives. Every day that we do not act on this is a day that the evidence evaporates from the scene. And I really plea for this committee to get together and not pursue this on a partisan basis. We need to have executives from the rail. Please, please don't be partisan. I don't know if that's going to work. Like, I wish that would work company from Norfolk Suffolk here. We need to have independent scientists here. We need to have the EPA or w whichever agencies, the CDC, DOT, whatever it may be. But this cannot be a political food fight. Evidence is evaporating and people are getting sick. And every day that we go on without this, without accountability, I mean, it's it's not even partisan because in my view, and I'll take ownership as well, both parties are failing in this moment to address the needs of people. And I just sincerely ask that, that we take this seriously because it's not getting handled at the levels that it needs to be handled. We need to know why there hasn't been a disaster declaration that has been requested yet. You know, I do know that the president is, is willing to offer one, but we need to cut through the red tape. and. If I can just make that plea, because I do believe that this committee, this committee, the oversight committee, has the unique jurisdiction and power in this body to be able to do that, to cut through that red tape. And so, you know, Mr. Chairman, I, I sincerely make that plea, me as a Democrat, to you as a Republican. I, I really don't want us to drag this out because, again, the half-lives on these chemicals, the fo we don't let folks return to the scene of a crime. And we've been letting that potentially potentially for, for almost a month now. So for the folks that are there, you know, and for the folks that, that came in yesterday, I just sincerely ask that, that we put things aside and we get to work. We had eight hearings this week. You know, we all showed up, we did this job, but, but let's get this to the top of the docket, please. Please. I hope that uh, they listen to her. What I can't help um okay oh my god there's a a farmer's cut video yes 
Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Sorry, I forgot to clean this up. Let me just... Da-da. Uh, yes. You find farmers sexy? Yeah. They're just like hard men working, using their hands. Yeah. Ask him what's the best vegetable for your libido. <laughs> Tell me, what's the best one for your libido? Eggplant? Egg <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Welcome to The Button, a speed dating show. When the button lights up red, either player may press it and swap out their date for a new person. Get out of here. If two people can last on a date for 10 minutes, they win an all expenses paid second date. I'm Aaron. Hey, I'm Andrew. Nice to meet you. So what do you do? Hut plus farmer wants a wife. What the fuck, is that a show? I'm currently the assistant studio manager of a gym. Oh, what about you? I said I work on a farm. That's cool. I work on a cattle ranch. Are they like pets? You don't want to get close to them, you know what I'm saying? I see. Yeah, because yeah. they don't stay. Oh my god. What do you think like a city person, like mainly they would hate? Waking up like really early. How early? Like whenever it like gets bright outside. Hmm. Do you find farmers sexy? Um. People that work the land. <laughs> How much do you date? My life kind of switches up a lot, and I don't want to get tied to one okay. spot, to one thing. I also feel like it kind of slows me down. Oh. Why did you pass? I feel like I may be able to connect a little bit better with somebody else. That's crazy. <laughs> That's so crazy. Well, it was nice meeting you. All right, it was nice meeting you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Ah, uh, okay, so you're a farmer. Yeah. Do you eat beef? I don't. Do you kill your livestock? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fun fact about Andrew, he had wolves growing up. A wolf? Yeah, like a pet wolf. Like he was in the house and everything. Okay. Let's hear your best howl. My what? best howl? <laughs> Three, two, one. Ooh. <laughs> Ask him if he howls during sex. Mm. <laughs> Just answer. Just no, answer. I don't. No. <laughs> is there something romantic about living on a farm? I am preconditioned to think that rural living is kind of masculine. I can see it being more attractive. Thanks. Just not really my type. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Andrew. I'm definitely more of like a friend, but not like, you know. No, I don't know. Not not like a intimate Quite friend. Different. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? My name's Andrew. Amalia. Amalia? Yeah. How old are you? 21. 21. Yeah. What the fuck? Okay. What do you do for? Why did they make it red immediately? For I am a waitress. So, like, you can get big tips? Oh, you can get some money right away. <laughs> I know, he's like, I gotta know. When I think about a farmer, I think about overalls and okay. he has no like shirt underneath. He's got shit to do. Um, I have shit to do. I don't wear overalls. I usually wear a shirt. Gotta get a little bit of a tan going. And okay. Then, then you can maybe take off your shirt where you're okay. working. Why'd you reject me? Oh, you're 21. <laughs> it's the nerves. <laughs> Masra. Amalia. So, Masra's a farmer. What do you farm? I farm mixed vegetables. What's the sexiest vegetable? Baby mustard greens, a variety I like called ruby streaks. Fun fact, yes. Masra grew up raising pigs. Pigs? Have you ever killed anything for your food? I have not. Eaten it? No? <laughs> I only eat chicken. Which, okay, I know, I know. Everyone shut up, it's fine. But like, not pigs and cows. Not pigs and cows, yeah. they don't. Have you been buzzing people out here? Well, one slaughtered pigs. Do you not slaughter pigs? I'm a veggie farmer. Oh. Yeah, but I don't think I'm opposed. Ask her if she finds farmers sexy. You find farmers sexy? Okay, so I guess, yeah. They're just like hard men sure. out working, using their hands. Yeah. Ask him what's the best vegetable for your libido. <laughs> Tell me, what's the best one for your libido? Eggplant? <laughs> Who knows? Have you ever wanted to escape the city life? I would not like be mad if I ended up on a farm. Somewhere sure. with like all these like little animals, but I wouldn't want to kill them. Got I want to raise them. So you need me to come kill the chicken for you? Probably. Got it. Yeah. Would you watch them? <laughs> Sorry. That's fine. Wow, that was aggressive. I know. Get her out. I just want to meet other people. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're really great though. I know. Thank you. It's great to meet you. Hi, Hi. you too. I don't think I've ever sweat so much in such a short period of time. It's just normal. <laughs> Hi. How you doing? Nice to meet you, yeah, Karen. Yeah, you too. Karen, Daniel. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Karen, Daniel. Yes. 
farms vegetables. What kind of veggies do you farm? Currently, uh, microgreens. I don't think they're you know, Okay, the, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do, do it, yeah. <laughs> See you later. Yep. <laughs> Microgreens, like that's not real farming. <laughs> Ooh, shame. <laughs> Hi, I'm Karen. What? Why not? What? What? Why? Literally, what the? Be nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Well, they call me Sav. You know. Sav. Sav. Do people ever question if you're a farmer? Yeah. Because of how I look, how I dress, you know, I don't wear them tight ass jeans. I think you could rock cowboy boots. My boots ain't cowboy boots, but they're pretty. Ooh. Uh, they're killing the game. Yeah. What kind of veggies do you farm? Everything. Okay. Uh, collard greens, kale, tomatoes, yeah. squash. Sad likes goofy women. Goofy? Yeah, I like funny women, you know, goofy, somebody that can like, make me laugh. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> why? Not my type. Okay, well, thank you so much. It thank nice you. meeting you. It was great to meet you, Karen. Next! How you doing? Good, how you doing? I'm doing good. This jacket is fresh. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, okay. Do you find each other sexy? Uh, Come on, so. <laughs> Do you think I can handle farming? The truth? I feel like you would get it, but you will probably complain about your back hurting. Why would my back hurt? Because you're bending over. When you oh, weave, so you're like in there. Are you lazy? Uh, am I lazy? Yeah, you just asked me if I was lazy? Yeah. I'm gonna let the next person go up. Maybe you might click. You ain't ugly. You feel me? Thanks. It was nice to meet you, Sav. Keelan? Can you repeat that? Keelan. Keelan. It's nice to meet you. My name's Sam. What kind of farming do you do? Last year we had broccoli, garlic, peppers. Pumpkins. I like Brussels sprouts. Is it important that you date someone that grows your own food? Not too important. What is a stereotypical farmer? I don't know, E-I-E-I-O, Ronald McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> Old McDonald yeah. had a farm. Yeah, that's not how it is. You know, you can look any type of way and be a farmer. Do you find each other sexy? Yeah, I think you're attractive. Uh, I think Samantha's cute too, yeah. I'm sorry, like, <laughs> the button, don't be messy. Don't use cute. <laughs> <laughs> Why? The okay. hell did you press the button? Just honestly, I'm here on the Why? button. I want to see what's next. Like, yeah. I think you're pretty cool, actually. I didn't expect to be yeah. a cool person right away. Yeah. It was fun to meet you. Yep. Thank you. Have a good day. So, how why you? did you reject her? Hi, how are you? Good, I'm Keelan. I'm Nicole. Nice, nice to meet you. So much, Tell me why. Are you a city girl? I, I am a city girl. Are you a farmer? Yes, I am a farmer. What do you farm? Broccoli, carrots, peppers. How does broccoli grow? Kind of grows like everything else, like <laughs> it grows I mean, like, like straight up broccoli. Oh. Like, yeah, so it has this leaf, and then the stalk starts to broccoli. So it has the flowers, kind of, but they look like leaves. Fun fact about Nicole: her dad has a farm in Indiana, and she's always wanted to retire and live on a farm. That's true. Oh, wow. Yeah, my dad has cattle. Have you ever slaughtered an animal with your bare hands? No. I was thinking about moving to Montana or somewhere. Oh. I'm sorry, just not my type. <laughs> What's your type? Just not this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it looks like we're not gonna have any matches today. No. Hopefully on Farmer Wants a Wife, they actually find true love. No. That's not. Is it ever okay to cheat? No. Would you stay with someone who cheated on you? Um, yeah. But it's not okay to cheat? No, but if, if they, Is it ever okay to cheat? Um, oh wow. Fucking no. No, I'm not good cool with that. Never, ever, ever, ever. No, not in any circumstance. What's cheating? So you lie about what you're doing, where you are, what your feelings are. You're letting your partner feel like they mean nothing to you. What do you constitute as cheating? Relying on somebody else for something that we exclusively rely on each other for. To me, it's emotional cheating. It can be physical. I think it's not the action, but rather like the emotion behind it. Commenting on girls' pictures on Instagram, you know, like a hard eyes or something. Why are you commenting on another girl's pictures? You're supposed to be commenting on mine. Is it ever okay to cheat? No. Uh, I think cheating, whether it's like micro cheating or like cheating, cheating, that's- Micro cheating? Micro cheating is like, Follow too many girls on Instagram. Do you know that from experience? Oh. <laughs> Are, you Are you looking at your husband over there? <laughs> I don't consider what Aww. I did cheating. 
relationship had ended, we weren't communicating anymore, so I continued talking to somebody else and I guess their feelings were still hurt. One of my exes would say that I cheated. What did you do? Had an encounter with a mutual friend while we were both incredibly intoxicated, and I don't consider incredible intoxication to be consensual, so I don't think I cheated, but she thinks that I cheated. What do you consider cheating? Definitely kissing. Yeah, I think like Wait, a kiss you could definitely chick? forgive. She looks hella familiar. What do you to be consent what do I know her intoxicated from? and had an encounter with a mutual friend while we were both incredibly intoxicated and I don't consider incredible intoxication to be consensual so I don't think I cheated but she thinks that I cheated what do you consider cheating definitely kissing yeah I think like a kiss you could definitely forgive anything kissing and beyond uh, it's, it's like a kiss is nothing I just kissed another girl and like seeing how it affected my partner at the time I would never do it again some cultures just kiss as like a greeting or a goodbye, so it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think cheating is just cheating. I think if like you let some girl kiss you and you fuck a girl, I'm not gonna care. I'm gonna leave you either way. Would you stay with someone who cheated on you? No, I have too much self-respect. What if they got really drunk and they, they kissed someone but it meant nothing? Um, maybe if we were like six months to a year into the relationship, I would accept that. If we were married, I'd probably accept it. Is it ever okay to cheat? No. 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 Never ever. Um, no. No. I, I don't think it is. Under any circumstance? Mm -hmm. Probably not. No. You hesitated. Um, I understand why people cheat. I think typically people are not satisfied with uh, their current situation. Why'd you cheat? I felt lonely. Even with a partner, I didn't understand that it was even possible to feel lonely with a partner. I think I just wasn't getting enough attention from the person I was seeing. It's fine to cheat, right? No. I say that as a cheater, like, no. Why did you cheat? They were ultimately gonna leave me anyway and I wasn't like worthy of it, so I needed something to like fall back on so I could pretend like, oh, it doesn't hurt. Do you regret it? Um, yeah, every single day, like. But wouldn't the relationship have ended anyways? Um, we're actually, they, we're still together, so. <laughs> Would you stay with someone who cheated on you? I tried. I had planned that this was the person I was gonna be with. I was terrified of like what life would look like without this. And it ended up being like three more years of hell. Is it ever okay to cheat? No. Mm -hmm. Not for me. No. You didn't say that right away. I'm trying to think of edge cases. If there were some kind of situation set up with an agreed hall pass. What if they had sex with Shakira? I think we might be able to stay together. Why? Well, I was thinking like, if I had sex with Michael B. Jordan, then I feel like I'd want them to be okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it ever okay to cheat? No, no, nope. The way I see it, if you like really love someone, you would never cheat. If you like have the desire to cheat, like at that point, you're pretty much done with the relationship. I feel like you should always at least communicate like if you want to end it before. Try an open relationship or something. There's so many avenues before you could cheat. Is it ever okay to cheat? No. That said, have I done it? Yeah. <laughs> Why did you cheat? Because I didn't know how to end the relationship. I only told him I cheated to like make him not want to be with me anymore. If you want to go have sex with someone, talk about it, and then if they're not comfortable with that, then break up. It's pretty simple. It's easy to just say words and yeah. say, just be honest. Like, just communicate. I think that's like the biggest thing. I want to be with this other person. At the same time, it's very hard to do that. It's easier just to fuck somebody. It's okay to cheat sometimes because I think sometimes people can't get out of relationships. Well, why not just break up with the person before you cheat? Super easy to say, but we can't always do that. Like what if you're stuck or you feel stuck or you're being like abused or manipulated or just you feel like that might be the only option to make that person leave you? Sometimes people are stuck in really fucked up relationships. I tell like my mom <laughs> that if she cheats on my dad, I'd be okay with it. <laughs> Why? Um, I'm not the biggest fan of my dad. Have you ever been cheated on? I have not. Well, not that I know of. I have been jealous of people that my partners have been around. I'd say there's like suspicion, but like nothing concrete. Have you been cheated on? I've been cheated on, yeah, or kind of lied to. What was the lie? Uh, that she wasn't talking to her ex. My ex was actually in love with his ex. 
during like most of our relationship. I guess that's sort of cheating. Did you know about it? Um, I found out after we had broken up, so it was just like, fuck you again. <laughs> Is it yeah. ever okay to cheat? I've been cheated on so many times, it really sucks. I'm laughing because I recently got cheated on. He hooked up with someone. To my understanding, it was like two nights when I was asleep. Ooh, did you stay with him? Yeah, we're in couples counseling, we're working on it. Have you cheated or been cheated on? I hate that question. Cause I have cheated once, I got too cocky. I don't know, I felt like I was a shit, so I was like, might as well do it. And why did you do it? The thrill, it feels good. I'm just a simple man, you know? Have you been cheated on? I have been cheated on. I guess I wasn't as confident as I thought cause I was like, let me look at the phone. Tinder is on the phone, so. You don't think it's gonna happen to you, I guess, but it also is super common, so why would I think that it wouldn't happen? Why does it happen so much? I definitely don't feel like monogamy is natural for me, and in non-monogamous relationships, it feels a lot easier and more comfortable being open with my partner about our desires and not lying to each other. Would you stay with someone who cheated on you? I don't know. I guess it would depend on the circumstance, life is really messy. Depends on how long it's been going on, how I find out probably matters. I know that he's a good person, so if he makes a mistake, I know that people make mistakes and they can just recover from that. You're madly in love with someone. You've been with them for a while. Mm -hmm. They cheat. Do you stay with them? No. 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 I don't think I could. I think my trust would be really shattered afterwards. I can't, because it's not the same trust, not the same bond, it's a different person. When you look at that person and they're not seeing you, no. I mean, if there's no trust, then what is there in a relationship? I have like a zero tolerance policy. No emotional cheating, no physical cheating. So you would leave him if he was talking to someone? And... Yeah, if he found himself feeling the need to turn his phone over when someone just texted him something, game over. Like, I wanna say True. no. I wouldn't. Oh my God, that's, that's a fucking pro tip. If they're always turning their phone over, very sussy, very suspicious. If they always take their phone with them when they like go to the bathroom or whatever, very sussy. Wanna, I don't know, like throw away like all the years of the relationship. Like in high school, no. Um, if you're married, yes. Because, well. Is it ever okay to cheat? Um, no, no. Would you stay with someone who cheated on you? Um, yeah, I'm pretty forgiving. But it's not okay to cheat. No, but if, if they could actually express that they are sorry and they can find fault in what they did and understand that they hurt someone and that they need to build that trust back, then yeah, I think you should give people a second chance. I would stay with them because I have attachment issues and it can be hard for me to move on from a person even when they've hurt me. Like you don't get a pass, but if you cheat and then you come back and you're like, here's how this happened, here's what I learned from it, then we can, yeah, we can work with that. It would take talking. It would take a lot of talking. If someone cheated on you, would you stay with them? Oh yeah, I have. Oh. Someone cheated on me for an, a, an extremely long amount of time and didn't tell me that I found out, then it was a lot of like, no, don't go. I did stay with them. Uh, we dated for like another year after the cheating. Why did you stay with them? Uh, because he lied and told me that it wasn't true and I just wanted to believe it. It won't happen again, that it was, didn't mean anything. Did it happen again? Yeah. Would you stay with someone who cheated on you? Like, I would like to say that I wouldn't because I'm like a strong, independent woman, but I've definitely stayed with men that have been unfaithful to me. Why? I was really comfortable and probably just like afraid of what my life looked like without them because for a while, they were my life. Relationships are more multi-layered than what they seem like. It's just not black and white. Where are you from, buddy? Upstate New York. Upstate New York. Do you live here now? Yeah. Did you move here? Are you going to school or what? I moved here three years ago. Okay. How come? Just cause, really. Just cause. From upstate New York, you're like, fuck it, Arizona. We're going to do it. <laughs> 
more fucking Stavi roasting his fucking crowd. I love this shit. Phoenix? I was living with a guy who had family out here. So your roommate, his, your roommate's family was from here, yeah. and you're like, that's enough of a reason for me. <laughs> not a girlfriend, not a job. A guy you split HBO Max with <laughs> was born here, and you're like, yeah, fuck it, I don't care. Nobody else in my life cares about me enough. <laughs> oh. Is he like a close friend, at least? My roommate. Just a roommate. No, you wouldn't even call him a friend. No, we went, we went to high school together. You went to high school together. Okay, so, okay. so you're pretty close. So you're like, do you still live together? No. No, okay, so you branched out. By yourself? No, new roommate. Damn, dude. Are you... Are you a gay man who doesn't know it's okay? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, one of my roommates, uh, and I have another roommate. It didn't work out with my other roommate. We had different attachment styles. <laughs> it's okay if you are. You know, it's fine. Yeah, I'm just poor. You're not gay, you're just poor. Okay, that's fine. You could be both, you know? You can, you know. <laughs> All right, nice. Uh, what do you? What, how's the how's the pad? You guys have? You have two bathrooms or one? Bathroom? <laughs> two, bathrooms. two bathrooms. There you go. That's big. Yeah. Is, are your lives going good? Have you had sex with anybody with leathery titties? Have you ever fucked an old woman? No. What's the oldest person you ever leathery. had sex with? Uh, forty-five. Forty-five. Okay. How old are you? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Whoa! Look at that. <laughs> Who is this forty-five year old? That's this. Come on. It was your old roommate's mom? Yeah. yeah, I wasn't allowed in the house after that, so. Uh, you're my old girlfriend's mom. You're, no! Oh, your old girlfriend's mom is what you want me to believe. The person you fucked. I fucked her mom first. You fucked her mom first? <laughs> what the fuck? How? Where'd you meet her mom? You worked at the same restaurant. Oh, so you, oh wait, you fucked two generations of losers, is what you're saying? <laughs> That's hilarious. So you're a what? You're a busboy, a barback? What are you? I was the busboy. You were a busboy. She's a server or is she a manager? What is she? She worked at the front desk. Front desk. So she, the mom is like a hostess. No, the mom was the front desk. The mom was the front desk. <laughs> yeah. What is a... Uh, what is the a, daughter was a hostess. What, front desk and hostess is a different job? <laughs> There's a front desk. It's not a fucking hotel. Yeah. It's... It was also a hotel. Oh, it was a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> what a classy family you fucked. <laughs> the, I fucked two women that worked at, the, at, the, at a seafood restaurant in a La Quinta Inn. <laughs> All right, so you're the bus boy, and then how did you fuck the mom? What happened? It was just like a we just used to like stay after and stay, get drinks. Stay after, get drinks. But I wasn't old enough to like. So you were 19. Get served. Yeah. So you're, okay. So I wasn't old enough to get served, so she would give me drinks. She would give you drinks, and then and then one night it just popped off, or what? Who made the first move? She did, or you did? Well, she drove me home. She she got me. No. She drove me. Oh my god, you were you were <laughs> by this moment. <laughs> This lady underage fed you booze. Yeah, this is getting very, very sussy very fast. Oh, God. Until you needed to be escorted home. And then she fucked you? Is that what happened? <laughs> you're, you're now realizing one of the most awesome stories of your life was a crime committed against you. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't fucking even walk. And so she just... I was throwing up all over the place. I begged for a doctor. She was like, I got all the medicine you need, baby. <laughs> <laughs> so you're your fucking mind. This woman 45, this woman who's 20 years older than you takes you to your house. Did you have a roommate? Who were you living with? Oh, we went to her house. You went to her house. Oh, so she took you back to her house and then Where nice. Yeah, where's the door? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it, but everybody else, please refrain from asking direct questions. That was good. We're gonna get to the daughter. Believe me, I didn't forget about the daughter. But I pretty, just a little patience. Give, have a little trust in me, all right? We, I did sniff this out. I don't know. You gotta admit, the odds of finding this guy were pretty low. We found him. So. <laughs> okay. All right, so, okay, and then you just fuck, do you ever fuck her again? Do you ever fuck the mom again? Was it one and done? One and done. 
one and done. And then you just sparked, you never talked about it again? It never came up? No, she was like, you know who you would like is my dog. No, no, you're lying. You're fucking lying. Be honest with me. What was the restaurant called? Okay, all right, all right. He, he had it ready to go. I'll give him that. Um, she set you up, so she was like, you know, wow, this is an interesting mom. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> She took like the mom that was like, look, you can get drunk at my ba at my house. Just do it at my house. She took that to the next level. It was like, you can fuck strange cock, but I'm gonna get his taste first. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure he knows how to lay it down. Did you do a good job fucking mom? Probably. Probably. Are you good at fucking normally? Be honest with you. Give me a real self assessment. Now, yeah. yes. But not at 19. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How old are you now? You said. 25. So in six years, you've, you've picked up a couple tricks in the trade. Been around the block. Been around the block. What's your orgasm rate? When you say? How many women bust? 40%? 50. 50. Okay. You're proud of 50. You're proud of your proud of... All right. That's, I guess that's, that's something I should probably... So 50, you would be, you would be failing. That's an F. That's below... <laughs> It's not even a D, it's an F, but that's fine. I'm happy that you think that's good. And some of those aren't even, you, you didn't really do anything. Some probably busted pretty easily, right? You probably, you probably got a couple lucky ones, right, in there. Come on, don't fucking start shrugging now, motherfucker. Don't clam up on me now. You're fucking all loosey-goosey about fucking before, about being by your boss. Oh, you need that time off? Let me see about that. Why don't you have another tequila soda and we'll talk about your PTO request. <laughs> and she really set you up with her, with her daughter? For real? You're not lying to me here? And then you just dated and your, her Crazy. daughter was cool. Did your, her daughter know you, she fucked you? After she broke up with me, yeah. Oh! So your mom, your mom, her mom didn't tell her that she fucked you? No. Wow, what a diabol- I'm guessing these women have, do not have a good life. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, were they back in upstate New York or here? Oh, in upstate New York. Have you kept tabs on them? Still follow her on Instagram. You still follow on Instagram? <laughs> Is the mom looking good still? No. No, you, you, you caught her at the tail end of her prime? <laughs> you caught her in the Wizards Probably. Jordan years? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. <laughs>
don't like me when well, I'm on the road. I speak, shit, that's what I love. Can't see what I can't control. Did it once, yeah, I do it once again. Watch my father, yeah, he taught me how to win. Don't like me when well, I'm on the road. I speak, shit, that's what I love. Can't see what I can't control.